Uh, good morning. I'm Carl Alto. Uh, I, I hadn't expected everybody to, to sit right away. I'm just stalling for time, actually, right now. <laughs> so, uh, and not everybody's here, obviously, and we're waiting for a few more people. Uh, I just wanted to say hi and welcome uh, uh, um, to, our, to our conference. And uh, let me see, how much more time do we have? Um, we have um, a, a full day today of, um, of, a, of a great program. We are glad that you're here with us. And we have a lot of people to be thankful for. Um, obviously, all of you who are here today uh, we have a record number of embassies uh, that are being represented here today, besides the Baltic embassies. Uh, we're expecting uh, to have, and, and again, maybe it's a little too early, but uh, uh, the embassies of Bulgaria, uh, Croatia, Albania, Macedonia, Finland, the Czech Republic, Malta, if I didn't say Macedonia, I'll say it right now. And um, members from the Baltic American community from East Coast to West Coast to the, the middle of the country, maybe some from outside of the country. Uh, we have um, uh, many of our sponsors to thank, uh, th thank today, and, and we'll do that through the day, but I just wanted to make sure that uh, I, I did say that for the record. Um, First and foremost, we, we thank the Baltic American Freedom Foundation uh, for being our first ever AMBER sponsor. So uh, Laura Lyons, are you here already? Laura, hi. She's right there. Thank you so much for your, for your great generosity. Uh, you've provided uh, a, a boost to our, to our last two conferences. Uh, you've been wonderful. It's been great to work with you. And, uh, and you've provided us uh, this summer already with our third uh, very talented Baltic uh, professional and professional intern. Uh, we've had, uh, four years ago, uh, an intern, uh, Lita Juberta, who is now a press spokesperson for the, I believe, still with the Latin government. Uh, Carolina Kelder, who was here a couple years ago, who's working with the Estonian Ministry of Defense, and we're expecting uh, this summer our third intern. Anna Udre, who's uh, currently uh, uh, a reporter for Delphi. So uh, it's added so much to, to the work that JBank does. And then we cooperate with your um, group of, of young future leaders who, who come in August. And we have a program for them on Capitol Hill every year. I think this year will be, is it the fourth year already? It, it's really amazing. And, and they, it, it's great to see these very ener energetic young people who are going to be doing great things. And uh, it, it really. Um, uh, gives us uh, a sense of purpose too. So I wanted to thank you and, and all of your uh, uh, board members and, and, and fellow BAF, BAF folks. So uh, you know, from all of us, thank you very much. I, I have to say thank you also to all of our uh, Baltic American organizations, uh, our our J Bank um, parent organizations, the Estonian American La uh, National Council, the American Latin Association, and the Lithuanian American Council. And then, uh, in addition, the American Latvian Youth Association, uh, who has been one of our sponsors this year, um, as well as uh, always, consistently, the, the World Federation of Free Latvians, uh, who has supported us. Uh, so there, there, are, there are a lot of people to thank. I'm already talking too much. I'm past my one minute. Uh, and, and now I want to uh, start getting into the program. Um, we are live streaming today. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank Marcus Kolga, who's going to be one of our moderators. Uh, he's an a international man of uh, mystery, and he's going to unravel some of the mystery for us today. Um, but um, uh, we really couldn't do any of this high tech. Well, that's, that's us. But the, the, the live stream is uh, going to be happening. And, and, and so I wanted to thank especially Marcus and Up North and, um, and, and all the work that he does to, to make all of this possible to uh, to a larger audience. So now I wanted to introduce our, our current uh, J-Bank president, uh, Salius Caprice from Chicago, the president of the Lithuanian American Council. So Salius, it's yours. Good morning. 
and uh, welcome to the 12th J Band Conference here in Washington, D.C. We welcome our distinguished guests, speakers, and participants to this conference. We meet at an historic juncture when the future development and sovereignty of Central and Eastern European countries is again being challenged by the East. Since its inception in 1961, the Joint Baltic American National Committee, founded by the three national Central Baltic American organizations, as mentioned, the Estonian American National Council, the American Latvian Association, and the Lithuanian Council, has consistently informed our elected officials and the public about the Baltic struggle for freedom. It worked tirelessly to promote Baltic membership in NATO and the European Union. And today we must confront the current aggression, aggressive stance of Vladimir Putin. Jay Bank's response to Moscow's brazen violation of sovereignty in the Ukraine and elsewhere has been most energetic. Meetings with U.S. government officials over the last year, including Senators Durbin, uh, Kirk, and McCain, have been very productive. Today, we thank you for participating in this conference and trust you will find it informative and inspiring. It is our hope that it will be a catalyst for future action and community cooperation among the Baltic Americans and their freedom-loving friends in defense of national sovereignty and human rights. Thank you. Carl, I'll ask you now to introduce our ambassadors. And we just ask the uh, Baltic Embassy representatives to uh, come to the stage, please. Um, so, um, we uh, now are very, very fortunate to have uh, the Baltic embassies. We, we always have the Baltic embassies uh, as, as, our, as our great friends and partners and uh, uh, colleagues, compatriots here, here in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm just going to turn it over to you right now, and, and, and as, as you'll see, we have Ambassador Andres Teichmanis from the, from the Embassy of Latvia, Ambassador Rolanis Kushunas from the Embassy of Lithuania and Marki Tehonova Krek from Estonia, the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission. So um, um, maybe we'll just go in, in this order. Andres, please. Uh, thank you, Carl. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my real pleasure to welcome all the participants of 12th J Bank for the conference. This is the first conference for me. I do feel particularly honored to be here. And I see this is really an excellent tradition. Uh, which provides an excellent platform to discuss and exchange ideas about <coughs> topics of very up-to-date and very topical uh, issues we, we need to discuss related to Baltic States and United States common issues and common interests. Hodike's uh, Joint Baltic American National Committee has advocated the cause of Baltic communities in Washington, D.C., and across U.S., particularly focusing on many people on the Hill. J-Bank promoted ideas of liberty, demand for independence, and security for Baltic states. J-Bank played a key role in supporting Baltic states' reintegration 
into Western communities, joining to NATO, and JBank continues its proud, proud tradition today. JBank act actively informs US decision makers about current challenges to European security, advocating particularly support for European Reassurance Initiative and providing greater awareness about Russia's policies. <coughs> Today, there is a particularly strong necessity for transatlantic link and unity between United States and European countries, countries of European Union and all the partners in NATO, unity across the Atlantic. Today, when we see the challenges coming from international terrorism, from aggressive actions of Russia, this link is particularly important. Latvian government very highly values and supports <coughs> these activities, and I'm very happy to be today together with my good colleague, former uh, foreign minister of Latvia, Maris Riekstinch, uh, who will uh, well, share his thoughts later. Uh, but Latvian officials, top officials, have been frequent guests at JPN conferences, and uh, they had been very supportive to JBank activities, and I can only wish for JBank to continue in the same top quality, top top quality, top efficiency uh, to continue this pro politics further. Thank you very much, and I wish you a very good conference. should have taken Latvian microphone, I guess, not Estonian one. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's a, and it's a strange feeling, you know, to, to be in the middle, because we are not in the middle geographically. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, I, I would say I agree with everything was, what was told by Andres, and I uh, just wanted to, pull, to probably raise a couple of other points. Uh, to me, uh, I would say this conference, which is always uh, very rich in content and very actual, uh, which is happening every two years. Uh, to me, it's a, in a way um, unofficial birthday of JBank, which we treasure a lot. Uh, and I think JBank deserves at least every second year to have two birthdays. And, um, uh, and JBank is also a very symbolic organization in a way because it's also all these conferences are usually a celebration of Baltic unity all of us three coming together, and not just Baltic unity on the other side of the Atlantic, where our countries cooperate uh, uh, quite actively, but also of unity of our diasporas <coughs> on this side of the Atlantic. And um, uh, with your help, we achieved a lot. And uh, yes, we are looking to our bright future. We are peace-loving, freedom-loving countries. We are not a threat to anyone. Maybe with one exception, uh, we might be a, a threat to someone who has a vision that uh, the dissolution of Soviet Union was the biggest disaster or tragedy of 20th century. Because we are success stories. We are very inconvenient success stories to the vision like this. You know, and, but we don't ask forgiveness by no means. We are happy to be free, and we will stay free, and we will fight for our freedom as much as it's needed. And it's, very, and it's also very comforting to know that our diasporas on this side also cherish this freedom of our countries and will always be of support to us. So thank you very much for invitation and I wish uh, the best uh, uh, to this conference, which I already know it will be a success uh, just looking at the content. Thank and thanks, Carl. I mean, uh, you really put a lot of heart on all of this. Thank you. I'm very happy and proud to be here together with my Baltic friends and uh, seeing so many familiar faces here uh, among the audience is, uh, means a lot to me. It means that our cooperation with you is, is very good and strong. Well, uh, and Carl and JBank, thank you so much for uh, taking this leadership this year 
and uh, many years previously as well to organize this conference. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this year's conference title refers to the, uh, to the new reality and tries to identify the role of the Baltic countries uh, in this changing world. This is the, the concept, the, the title of the conference. So here are some thoughts on these realities. Some of these are new, some of these we have uh, heard about before. And also thoughts on how do we Estonians, Baltics, uh, place ourselves to that picture. First, uh, on defense. There is no really novelty in saying that the security situation <coughs> in and around Europe does not show signs of calming down. The conflict in eastern Ukraine is ongoing. Russia is preparing uh, for a large-scale aggressive scenario, military exercises, and so on. Against that background, we strongly believe in the Baltics that security is something that cannot really be taken for granted. And yes, it has a price tag as well. Estonia is committed to keep its defense spendings about 2% of GDP for years to come. Um, and other Baltic countries have committed to do the same. At the same time, no matter how committed we are ourselves, we do need strong deterrence measures and reassurance that NATO's and the United States military presence in our region is persistent and visible. This visibility comes with a clear message, the message that we stand together, all for one, one for all. Secondly, there's nothing new either when saying that we all face the cyber attacks and the source is often the same as the source of a major cyber attack in Estonia 10 years ago, 2007. So we do see a need and a big potential in working closely with our partners and allies in the field of cyber security and cyber defense. Thirdly, we should not undermine the fact that there are countries out there who have an upper hand in the information domain, contro controlling their own media outlets, using propaganda, disinformation, fake news, trolls, etc. Finally, the transatlantic bond can only be strong if we, Baltic countries, and more widely, Europe as a whole, contribute to its strength and growth, both from inside and also externally. Estonia will be proud to hold the European Union presidency for six months, starting from July 2017. We will look forward to working together with uh, all of you, with all of our contacts, partners, allies, both sides of Atlantic, on topics which are important for us, uh, such as EU-NATO cooperation, transatlantic digital and cybersecurity cooperation, countering terrorism together, etc. So ladies and gentlemen, these are my giveaways, uh, some food for thought for today's discussions, and. Uh, I wish uh, successful conference for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassadors. Uh, when we look to the work of J-Bank, uh, its official inception was 1961. However, its roots go far back in history. 
Already in 1915, the Baltic communities in the U.S. started organizing, especially the Lithuanian American Council. Uh, they funded information bureaus in New York and Washington. And uh, in 1922, they submitted a petition with a million signatures to the White House that the independence and statehood of the Baltic countries be recognized. And that would subsequently did take place, but it took the American government four years to come around to put that. In 1940, the historic meeting with the uh, FDR, where the non-recognition policy was enunciated, and it's now the basis for the policy with respect to Russian aggression in Crimea. Uh, the uh, Lithuanian American Council and these other Baltic organizations have a vast history, and we are kind of a model of cooperation and support, and uh, uh, I think it's something which our own countries ought to emulate. We're very honored uh, this afternoon to have as our next speaker, Ambassador Kurt Volker. Uh, he is the um, executive director of the McCain Institute for International Leadership and uh, <clears throat> based in Washington, D.C. Ambassador Volker is a career member of the U.S. Senior Foreign Service and with over 23 years of experience working on European policy under five U.S. administrations. Ambassador Volker contributes regularly to the public debate and has published in numerous publications, including the Washington Post, Foreign Policy, La Stampa, the Christian <coughs> Science Monitor, International Herald Tribune. From July 2005 until 2008, Ambassador Volker served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs responsible for U.S. policy on U.S.-European relations. From 1999 to 2001, Ambassador Volker was the Deputy Director of the private office of the then NATO Secretary General, Lord Robertson, and as a State Department Legislative Fellow in the U.S. Senate from 1997 to 1998. Ambassador Volker worked in foreign policy matters for Senator John McCain, his prior Foreign Service assignments included Brussels, Budapest, London, and several positions to the U.S. Department of State. He has also numerous bilateral relations. He oversaw strategic planning and congressional relations and was responsible for management of roughly 78 overseas posts, 300 domestic employees, and a budget of $400 million. I have the honor to present Ambassador Kurt Volker. Well, I guess we're still waiting for the <laughs> Ambassador. Carl's suggestion, let's take a coffee break. <laughs> and, uh, uh, have a little inter-parliamentary discussion. <laughs> Back here as soon as Kurt Volker arrives, we're expecting him just in a few minutes.
We already made our introductions and we're honored to have as our speaker, Ambassador Kurt Volker. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. and I apologize for being a little bit late this morning, but it is an honor for me to be here. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit today about why the Baltic states matter to the United States. Uh, I think this is something that often gets lost in the dialogue about all of the issues that we face, whether it is what's happening in Washington and the, uh, the Trump administration and all the attention coming to and from and about Russia, or when we then try to deal with that, well, what's the U.S. interest in Russia? Uh, do we care about NATO in Article 5 or not? And I think lost in this is some of the sense of purpose. And I think the Baltic states are probably one of the most important examples, if you will, um, a, a test case for us ourselves as to who we are as a country. And what happens to the Baltic states truly does matter for the health and well-being of the United States. And I think to get at that, the, the best way is to talk about well, what is the United States? What are we as a country? And we're a country based on core fundamental values, freedom, democracy, market economy, rule of law, human rights. That is uh, what defines us. And we are best off and healthiest and most prosperous when we are uh, respecting those values and those values are ascending in the world. And we need to be in a community of nations where those values are respected as well. It's what makes us safe. It's what gives us trading partners. It's what gives us uh, allies when we deal with challenges that arise. It helps build strong international systems, whether it's trading systems, the World Trade Organization, the IMF, or security organizations, so that we can work together to protect ourselves against outside threats. Um, people will remember that after 9-11, uh, it was the NATO alliance uh, one day later that first, for the first time in uh, close to 60 years, uh, had invoked Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, the Collective Defense Clause. It was because we had allies, because those values were shared by many others, that that happened. And it was a great reassurance to people uh, in the United States that that was the case. And ultimately, we did uh, uh, work together to uh, uh, to go after Osama bin Laden, to significantly weaken al-Qaeda. We're obviously not done with the fight against terrorism, but it has sharpened our sense of who we are as a community and what we are fighting against. When the opposite is true, when you see that these values are under threat or being challenged or under uh, being pushed back in the world, that community is shrinking. And we've seen examples like that over time. It is always just a matter of time before that directly impacts the United States. Uh, if we see that whatever it may be, an ideology such as Nazism or uh, Soviet communism, or in this case perhaps even terrorism, if we see an ideology or if we see an aggressive state such as the Soviet Union was uh, or as Nazi Germany was, if we see countries under threat if we see those values being squeezed and challenged and eventually pushed out, uh, it is something that changes the world that we live in. It becomes a less safe world for the United States. Our opportunities become more limited. And in each of these cases, we've always ended up getting involved ourselves to uh, defend those values and to defend allies and friends, usually from very far behind and at very great cost to this country. So that's why I think it's important to pay very close attention to the margins, to the edges. Where are the boundaries of freedom now? And is that expanding or is that being contracted? And what we've seen since 1989 is a tremendous expansion in where these values of freedom, democracy, rule of law, and so forth are respected in their own societies, where we are able to work together across uh, uh, nations to strengthen support for those values and to give hope and inspiration both to our people and to people where that is still being fought for. And it has been a tremendous trajectory over that period of time. We've seen during that period of time the rise of 
new and stronger challenges. And no one, I believe, in this country can anymore debate whether Russia is an authoritarian country, whether Russia is deliberately trying to have an impact on our own country, on other Western countries, whether they present a credible uh, threat to our societies, to our alliance. Whether they intend to act upon that is something that we need to pay close attention to and to deter. And uh, I have to give uh, uh, previous administration, President Obama, uh, particularly the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, General Phil Breedlove, and also the NATO Alliance, for getting to the point where we now have NATO troops deployed in the Baltic states, in Poland, in Romania, precisely to create that deterrent to raise a question in the mind of any adversary, particularly in this case Russia, whether in fact it would be worth it, whether there could be any gain from any kind of aggression toward the Baltic states. And I think the answer to that is no. And so I think that is a very strong and effective deterrent right now. Uh, we need to stay focused on that. But nonetheless, we continue to face this more aggressive Russia. And we're also facing a, a more assertive China we're facing a continuing ideology of terrorism that is reflected today in the form of ISIS and other groups. And these are things that will continue to challenge our societies. Uh, that's why I think the United States and our NATO allies need to stay focused on this periphery of making sure that the Baltic states and Poland and Romania, these frontiers of freedom, if you will, are healthy and that we are continuing to inspire others. Uh, I have to say that at this point, um, I think the current administration, the Trump administration, has done a good job at continuing this tradition. I know there's a lot of debate in this town about uh, a lot of the issues concerning Russia, about domestic politics, uh, about the FBI director, about investigations, and on and on and on. And it is really troubling to see this turmoil in the US. But I would also make the argument that when it comes to major foreign policy issues, the current administration has pulled itself together to get those right. And I was at the Munich Security Conference in February this year when the major question was, is the United States committed to NATO? Uh, there had been talk during the campaign about whether under a President Trump, the US would remain committed to collective defense in Article 5. And he said NATO was obsolete, and then we'd have to check whether countries had paid their bills or not. But after becoming president and pulling in a, an extraordinarily strong national security team of General Mattis at uh, the Defense Department, McMaster now is the national security advisor, uh, Mike Pence at the CIA, uh, Secretary Tillerson at the State Department, um, I'm sorry, Pompeo at the CIA, uh, Pence as vice president, um, Secretary Tillerson at the State Department, um, they were able to pull together and deliver a very clear message at the Munich Security Conference, a very strong support for NATO. Yes, we want countries to spend their 2% of uh, GDP on defense, but we understand the purposes of this and we are committed to it. That was reiterated both by Secretary Tillerson in his NATO foreign, Affair, foreign minister's meeting, Secretary Mattis in the NATO defense minister's meeting, uh, and by President Trump himself when he had the Secretary General of NATO Stoltenberg visit him at the White House. So there's been a very clear and consistent message about NATO. Probably one of the issues that the Russians are watching closely is our handling of Ukraine. And while there had been some expectations that the U.S. might lift sanctions on Russia to ease pressure to cut a deal over the heads of the Ukrainians, that has not happened. And in fact, the administration has several times reiterated that sanctions will remain in place until the conditions that created those sanctions in the first place are corrected. And uh, that has clearly not happened. Uh, so I think that those issues have been parked and put in the right perspective looking forward. And I would add to that the pressure on North Korea, the alliance with Japan and South Korea, uh, trying to find a constructive working relationship with China where we have both competition and interests. Um, the chemical, uh, the attack on Syria after their use of chemical weapons. And now what we see is in President Trump's first uh, foreign trip, an effort to pull together an alliance against ISIS. And it will include a stop at NATO for a, a first quick NATO summit meeting uh, where I think we'll be reinforcing this commitment to this alliance. 
Um, I think there's a long way to go. I think we're in, what, four months into this administration. There's a lot we have yet to see. Uh, I am encouraged by where we have gotten thus far, but I think there is more to be done. But fundamentally, I want to come back to where I started, which is that it is a fundamental American value, independent of party. We've seen it across multiple administrations, uh, independent of a particular issue, that the health, well-being, and security of countries that cherish democratic values, apply them in their own societies, and want to work with the United States, it's our fundamental interest that those countries are successful. And there has been no better example of success than the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. I think they're really a model of the realization of those values, and that's why it is a fundamental American interest to be closely aligned with these countries to make sure that your success is safe and secure for the future. Uh, I think if there's any question that comes up about that in the future, we haven't seen it today, but if it does come up, I think there's a very strong basis across party lines in this country to stand up for exactly those values and those principles. So that's what I wanted to, to discuss with you today. I would be delighted if you wanted to have a discussion and question and answer, but I'm also very respectful of our organizers and the timing of their program. So whatever is, uh, is best for you, Carl, and, and for you, Henry. So thank you very much. I think at the, at the current moment, I would say the likelihood of NATO forces being stationed in the Baltic states on a continuous basis is very high. Uh, we've seen the initial deployment of the U.S. forces be turned into a NATO program to have then different lead countries take the lead in each of the Baltic states and for those deployments to be rounded out with the contributions of other forces. So that aspect of a NATO country presence, a battalion in each of the Baltic states, I see continuing for a long time to come. The particular question about a U.S. presence is um, it's one that has not been addressed in this administration, and there is not currently a plan to get a U.S. presence into these countries of, of any kind of capacity. We have the U.S. presence as part of that NATO package in Poland, and we also have a bilateral U.S. presence in Romania. That Polish presence is part of the NATO effort overall. It forms a brigade headquarters as well as a battalion capability, and it is connected in terms of concept and planning to the Baltic states. But I, I think your question is getting at a fundamental point, which is how does Russia perceive this presence, and how do the Allies perceive this presence? We would not want Russia to come to a conclusion that um, the U.S. is less committed to the Baltic states. And we wouldn't want our allies to come to that conclusion. That yes, we're committed to NATO as a whole, Article 5, but we're going to be in Poland and on the, on the fringes out there in the Baltic states. It's somehow not the same. We would not want any of our allies to come to that conclusion or the Russians to come to that conclusion. And there's a risk that if we have that pullback from the U.S., if we don't take steps to communicate the opposite, people may start to wonder. Uh, fortunately, I, I think one of the aspects that we're doing is a robust exercise program that brings U.S. forces in on a periodic basis. So we are training and exercising there and then going back out again. And we are also obviously using the NATO alliance to communicate a collective commitment. But uh, I would like to find a way, if, if uh, I could be, have any role in recommending things to do what you're asking, is look for a way, in addition to the battalion strength presence of other NATO allies, to find a way to the U for the U.S. to be physically embedded in that or doing something specific in each of the Na uh, Baltic states as well. 
because I think um, the, 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 the appearance of unity of effort, that it is all of the allies in or all the allies equally committed is what makes NATO's deterrence as strong as possible. It's what we had during the Cold War. Uh, we were very much on the front lines in each of the major places. And it was a clear signal that any effort to do anything at all would immediately involve the United States and therefore the alliance as a whole. Uh, I think we're very close to that, but I think there's still a little bit more we should be pushing for to, to, to strengthen deterrence and to, to increase the U.S. presence. Uh, now we have questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, how do you think the... Um, the microphone. Oh. <clears throat> how do you think the uh, strained situation uh, between uh, the Kremlin and the um, regime in uh, Belarus is likely to uh, develop over the very near term? especially uh, with regard to the Zaha, the Russian Western maneuvers that are coming up. Yeah. Uh, big war games, massive war games. Yeah. And uh, you hear stories uh, that some in Belarus at least are concerned that um, the Russians will have a leave behind. <laughs> so they'll have this very large exercise and then they'll agree, agree uh, with Belarus afterwards that they'll create a leave behind presence, a forward presence which they would argue is similar to what we just talked about with the uh, NATO countries in the Baltic states. Uh, I would not rule that out. Uh, it is not something that the government in Belarus wants. And uh, I think they've made that known very informally and carefully thus far. Uh, it is probably about as much as they, they feel that they can afford to do. I don't think there would be uh, a dramatic reaction from allies in the West or the US if Russia were to do that. It might be more of a, another tick in the box of understanding what Russia is doing, but it wouldn't occasion any kind of uh, political or sanctions or military response to Russia doing that. I suppose the other reason Russia would be considering that is uh, to put some pressure on the situation in Ukraine to try to convey to the Minsk Group countries and to the United States that Russia is not backing down. The likelihood of it I would put uh, low. Uh, I think it would be a big step for Russia to try to do that. I think it would be, uh, it would be cementing in the minds of people, particularly in Western Europe, um, for a while at least, that Russia is a concern. We've already seen that. I, I was just in Germany earlier this week and I was struck at how the German perspective on Russia has shifted over the last two or three years. Um, there is really no debate right now in Germany about Putin being a friend, about Putin being reliable, about um, needing Putin in order to solve a problem. Uh, it is a very clear-eyed assessment that Putin is the problem. Uh, and uh, I think that a, a Russian leave behind in Belarus would cement that attitude. Russia spent a lot of effort, as we've seen, uh, trying to be influential in French elections, Brexit vote. Uh, they'll be trying to do so in German elections if they can, uh, particularly with the SPD uh, candidate Schultz. But I think an action like that would set back those efforts. So I think it's unlikely. Uh, I put it uh, less, than third, less than a third, maybe. But it is the kind of thing we should watch out for, and it's the kind of thing we should be paying attention to, that if it happens, it should, re it should reinforce our own commitment to the things that we've talked about, but particularly about the NATO alliance itself, and then ultimately to trying to restore territorial integrity to a country such as Ukraine. The, uh, Peter, and you have cut it off. Okay. Yes, yes, it's working. Uh, it's not working, okay. Um, I'm with the American Lightning Association. This is my colleague, so we'll have uh, two Lightning questions, I guess. Uh, we just had our uh, annual meeting a couple of weeks ago in Chicago where Latvians, American Latvians from across the country gathered, and it was interesting. There's palpable tension still from the election results. Uh, in our community, was somewhat divided between Trump and Clinton. The pro-Trump group 
I think would, one of the, you know, notwithstanding what Trump may have said during the campaign and his, uh, you know, uh, interest in Russia and, and apparent friendship with uh, Putin, the pro-Trump crowd would say, yeah, but Obama really didn't do, wasn't very good for Eastern Europe, wasn't very good, wasn't very interested in Europe in general, and his indifference to Europe sort of led to the rise of Putin, and that with Clinton we'd have more of the same, that Putin would continue to ride high. Um, but I thought it was interesting that you mentioned, or you said some positive things about Obama's mm -hmm. policies, especially the troop deployments, and of course Warsaw, the Warsaw Summit had a lot of good things for Eastern Europe. So. My question is, how are historians going to view the Obama presidency vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe and Eastern Europe in particular? Well, it depends if those historians are positively inclined towards President Obama or against, because uh, <laughs> you can build your case either way. Um, I, uh, I do think that uh, President Obama or his administration uh, was very slow to realize that the reset policy had failed, uh, Russia had taken advantage of it, and we were in a worse situation than when we started. And I don't think they would ever say publicly, oh yeah, that's what happened. Uh, they would say, no, no, reset was a great success, and then Russia changed. But uh, I, I, I don't see it that way. I think uh, from the beginning, the signals were that uh, we're not going to be as strong and closely aligned with our allies in Central and Eastern Europe, especially Poland, Czech Republic, but also the Baltic states, as the previous administration had been, and that Russia kind of has a free hand. That, that was, what, it may not have been the intended message. The intended message, I'm sure, was that we want to work together with Russia where possible, eliminate some of the problems in the relationship and see what we can get done. But that's not the way it was read by the people in the Kremlin. They, they, and it was not the way it was read by people in Central and Eastern Europe either. Uh, it was viewed as a US pullback and creating a vacuum. But I have to say, it was also the Obama administration that corrected that. And it began uh, after, uh, I don't, I'm not sure what date I could put to it, but it was after 2012, that was the, the second election of President Obama in the Chicago summit for NATO. Uh, it was probably somewhere on the run-up to the Whale Summit of 2014, uh, and probably significantly influenced by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that this was finally time to, to turn this around. And I do have to give particular credit to Phil Breedlove, who was the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, who, facing budget cuts and facing a lack of clear political guidance at home, was able to make decisions within his own authority as a Supreme Allied Commander to reposition assets that he had, so that as a, as a US commander in a UCOM capacity, repositioning assets in European theater to put more presence forward. And then by doing that, that became adopted by the administration and then adopted by NATO as a new approach. And all of that happened under President Obama. So while I would be critical of, of what happened initially and where we got there, I think it got turned around during the Obama presidency as well. Um, whether historians will reflect it that way or not, I don't know. I think some will be saying he was the greatest president ever, and some will be saying he was the worst president ever. And, and then that debate will go on. Uh, we are running out of time. Do you want to save the question for the next panel, perhaps? Okay. We'll thank the ambassador right. for coming in. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs> a great conference here. Keep the focus, keep the focus here on the Baltic States. be um, U.S.-Baltic relations, implications for security, and includes uh, Paul Goebel, uh, Stephen Flanagan, and Marius Reichschitz. Uh, please, panel members, come forward.
And just a little uh, program note also that um, uh, following the first uh, panel, uh, we had a, a coffee break scheduled. You're welcome to go and uh, get coffee after that, but we're going to get started right on the second panel. So uh, you're free to take coffee uh, anytime. We'll have coffee out there, I think, uh, uh, by about uh, uh, 11 o'clock. So, uh, but we will get started immediately with the second panel. So the second panel will begin at, at 11:15. So I'm uh, Tomas Sadowskis, and I'm going to be the, uh, the moderator and uh, try to keep the train running on schedule. I'll do a brief introduction for each of the three speakers, and then each of them will have about 10 minutes to talk about their particular uh, 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 points of view regarding the U.S.-Baltic relations and the implication for security. Uh, just a real, real uh, quick uh, setup, as, as mentioned before, uh, a lot of people are talking about the upcoming Russian exercise in September. Uh, Zapad 2017, or uh, Zapad is w Russian for West, and they have an interesting scenario. Uh, they've always uh, had the exercise in Western Russia, and uh, today's or this year's uh, exercise scenario is uh, a simulated it simulates an invasion of Belarus by NATO forces. So it uh, should be an interesting time uh, coming up there. And the good news, the uh, European Reassurance Initiative, when we first had it uh, funded back in 2016, it was only. 789 million, then in 17, it quadrupled to uh, 3.2 billion, and then in this year's uh, budget for FY fiscal year 2018, uh, they're proposing it be 4.8 billion, which is another 50% increase. So uh, some good, good news there. So our three speakers, our first speaker is, I'll just do the introduction for all three, and then we'll start off with uh, Paul speaking. Uh, Paul Goebbels, a longtime specialist on ethnic and religious issues, and uh, Eurasia, and he currently prepares a daily report on developments in that region for his blog, Window on Eurasia. Stephen Flanagan is our next speaker, who is a senior polit political scientist at the RAND Corporation here in Washington, D.C. And then our third speaker is Maros Lichtins, who is a former foreign minister of Latvia and is a, currently the inspector general for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Latvia. Uh, so, Paul, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. And as someone who has been speaking to uh, Baltic American groups for more years than a number of you have been alive, uh, I can tell you that one of the most confidence-building things about attending today is to see that the average age of people here has dropped. <laughs> uh, for so many years when one was in, uh, before 1991, the people got older and older and started dropping off and there were no young people. So it is a good thing to see young people and now being one of the old people, I can, I take a particular, pay particular attention to that fact. It is a sad fact of life that old generals and old diplomats inevitably prepare to fight the last war. They inevitably plan and often take actions designed to counter the threats that used to exist, and this has some terrible consequences. The first consequence is that when the threat that they have posited doesn't turn up, their ability to mobilize people against the threats that really are there disappears. If you say that Russian troops are about to come over the eastern borders of the Baltic countries and they don't come, the first question on Capitol Hill will be, well, are you really threatened? It is, however, far more a second and far more serious consequence of refighting the last war is that we inevitably ignore the real threats that are out there and think and force ourselves to think hard about what they are. It is all too often the case in this capital and in others that we adopt a Maginot Line strategy. <coughs> We decide that if we fortify the eastern borders of the Baltic countries, if we put NATO troops there, all the problems are over. That that is the guarantee of security 
now and forever. That is a very dangerous misconception, as we ought to know, given Russian actions in the last 15 years. I come back to the fact that I do not believe that Russia is going to invade the Baltic countries with military forces anytime soon, because it might be the only thing it could do that NATO would know how to respond to. But there is another problem related to this which is just as serious, and that is to interpret security threats elsewhere as if it's all about us. That what we do is why other people do things rather than they're being driven by their own demons. Some of you know that I was not terribly enthusiastic about the reset policy. But I'm here to tell you the reset policy had absolutely nothing to do with the shift in Russian policy that we have watched over the last decade and a half. Vladimir Putin saw a possibility of exploiting and promoting chaos, and he has used it. But that was not driven by our mistakes, much as we should not have made them. I think we have to realize that the Russian government of Vladimir Putin and the other criminals around him are not going to invade a NATO country with battalions or regiments or army corps. They're simply not going to do it. Doing it would probably start a war, although it might not. But what it would do would be to permanently undermine what Russia wants and not allow Russia to achieve what it can get by other means. No security planner in Moscow, except some of the troglodytes in the FSB and the Defense Ministry, actually would like to send military troops into Tallinn, Riga, or Vilnius, because they're pretty sure what that would mean for them. And no political leader in Moscow has, however much, he may want to resubordinate Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania to the Russian Federation would see using military force as the best or more efficient way to do it. Instead, we are confronting a very different kind of enemy in Moscow. It is an enemy that has fundamentally shifted its tactics, taking advantage of a new situation, and it is one that we have tended to be unwilling to face up to because it's not the threat we've prepared to defend against. In other words, instead of figuring out what the threat actually is and designing our defenses to it, we have doubled down on the kind of defensive strategy we had before. And it's about time, it seems to me, that we focus on exactly what Moscow will and won't do in the Baltic countries because it ain't going to send troops across the border. Because that's the one thing, I promise you, NATO and even the Trump administration would know what to do. There are much better and more efficient ways for Russia to achieve its ends, and it is prosecuting those things. I'd like to refer to three in descending order of how much attention they get. First, it has been common ground for all the people who denied the importance of nationality before the Soviet Union came apart in 1991 to obsess about ethnicity above everything else since that time, and to assume that Russian speakers or ethnic Russians in the Baltic countries are a wonderful lever for Russia's expansion. We have talked a great deal about their integration, and the fact is the Russians are discovering that those, that's a declining resource for them. Not only are the numbers and percentages going down, but the numbers of people who are Russian speakers or even ethnic Russians, self-proclaimed, who identify with being citizens or being wannabe citizens of these three Baltic countries is going up. Moscow's ability to play ethnic minority politics in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania is significantly less than it was in Ukraine, and it hasn't worked all that well there either. 
We will continue to worry about that, and we should work as hard as possible to integrate the Russian communities into the three countries so that Moscow can't take advantage because its old diplomats and its old generals are thinking in a past terms too. This is a, not a win situation for them. The second, however, is something that is far more important, far more significant, and something Baltic Americans and Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians in their countries don't want to talk very much about. And that is the Russian use of corruption and crime to project Russian influence. Since 2001, the Russian oligarchs, who are the agents in place of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, have exported from the Russian Federation 1.7 trillion US dollars, spending 100 million to corrupt or destabilize a neighboring country by buying people off is a rounding error. You simply don't have to spend very much to buy a bank, corrupt a government, destroy media, buy off intellectuals, and even people who were very, very good on Baltic issues 25 years ago want a comfortable retirement and they'll take money. And we're seeing that in all three countries, I regret to say. Organized crime, I mean, the Russian government is organized crime. And it is projecting, organi using organized criminal techniques across the region. I wish we could call the Russian government organized crime. We don't because we wouldn't want to do that and it would offend people, but the fact is, Vladimir Putin does not feel constrained by the normal rules of the game, and using criminal activity is exactly what he would do. I've often been asked to come up with, well, if you don't think they're going to send troops over, what do you think they are going to do? Well, let me give you one example. I could give you dozens, but I'll give you one. If I wanted, in Moscow, to have a dominant voice in Tallinn, the way I would do it is this. I would send an Estonian-speaking FSB officer across the border to rape an ethnic Russian girl in Narva. I would pull him out of Estonia, and then I would demand that the Estonians find the guilty party. And when they couldn't do it, I would demand, in international fora, that Tallinn accede to a Russian demand for a Russian presence in the Estonian in, uh, investigative arm, and I got news for you. There are a whole bunch of Western countries that would probably go along with that. That's a much more effective way of taking effective control over a neighboring Baltic country than sending in troops because it plays to the weakness the West has displayed. And third, and this is my last point, one of the reasons that J-Bank and the other Baltic American organizations are so important is that one of Russia's greatest efforts is to deprive Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania of its traditional support in the United States by lowering the importance and given to those countries and the attention that the American people and the American government pay to them. Five weeks ago, I was asked to testify uh, before a House uh, International Relations Committee subcommittee hearing chaired by Dana Rohrbach. <laughs> I regret to tell you it was one of the most horrific experiences I had because he denounced his own staff and all four of the uh, people giving testimony because all of, none of us had been willing to give Vladimir Putin's point of view. There is plenty to debate about America's policy in the Baltic region. But the idea that it should be cast in terms of what does Russia think represents a significant victory for the indirect attack against the Baltic states via Washington. On March 29th, 1991, I had the greatest honor of my life in working in the Baltic coast. 
That was when the Soviet occupation still existed, and it was only two months after the killings in Vilnius and Riga. One of my jobs as desk officer for Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, I insisted that we call that and not the Baltic desk, because the Balts live in Limburg on their Lahm in Germany, and they don't live in the three Baltic countries, <laughs> was to take leaders of the Baltic countries and others of former other Soviet republics around Washington to show them the sites and keep them from bothering American, senior American officials. And on that afternoon of March 29th, a Saturday, I took the president and foreign minister of Estonia on one of these tours. And I always made sure that these tours ended at the Lincoln Memorial. Because to me, that's the closest thing we have to a civic cathedral in this country. And we were standing in, the, in front of the statue, and I uh, was translating the Gettysburg Address into the only common language I had with Arnold Rutel into Russian. A national park ranger came running up to us. He had a folder. He said, what language are you speaking? I said, we're speaking Russian. He's got one of those. He said, are these people from Russia? No, I said, these people are from Estonia. And that national park ranger, who didn't have a Master of Arts in International Relations from some distinguished American university, I'm pretty sure, said what I consider to be the most important thing any American official ever said to a Baltic leader. He said, oh, he said, I've heard of Estonia. It's just a little country that wants to be free. It's your job and my job to make sure that future National Park Rangers and everyone else <coughs> knows that maintaining the freedom of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania is a lot more than worrying about NATO defense, is a lot more uh, than worrying about corruption and crime. It's about making sure that the achievements of these three people will be maintained into our children's and children's children's lifetime. Thank you very much. Oh, this is not working? No, I think it is. OK, great. No, we just thought we would, uh, in the interest of time, we'll just speak from here, Morris and I was just saying. Well, thank you. It's, it's great to see uh, many friends uh, of and, and from the Baltics here, uh, particularly Morris uh, and I who have worked together, had the pleasure to work before uh, together with Paul and others. Uh, Carl Altalou and I go back quite a way as well uh, to, uh, I remember first meeting him at one of the Central East European Coalition meetings back in the mid-90s when my, as a, as a longtime advocate of NATO enlargement, uh, going back to the George H.W. Bush administration, I had to go and sell the the Clinton decision that the Partnership for Peace would be the uh, best path to NATO membership, and I was not a happy, uh, it was not a happy message, but uh, but it was a promise that was uh, as disappointing at the time, but was ultimately delivered upon. And and I also remember very well um, having worked uh, with Morris and others on the Charter of Partnership with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Uh, that at the time in 1997-98 was seen as so controversial that the United States would welcome and expect. Quote, end, of, end of quote, that the, uh, those three states would one day become members of NATO. Uh, it took a great deal of effort to get to even that point. And then, of course, another promise that was delivered upon, uh, fast forward uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, 2004, when, of course, uh, that, that uh, membership was, in fact, realized. Um, uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, in, in 2014, uh, in the face of Russian aggression uh, in Ukraine and wider Russian assertiveness uh, in, in, in throughout Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the Obama administration quickly moved to uh, enhance our military presence, uh, uh, beginning with the Baltic Air Police and then other aspects of the European Reassurance Initiative and Operation Atlantic Resolve. Now, I say all this uh, not, as, uh, not as for the sake of nostalgia, but to remind us uh, how far, and, and some of the opening comments this morning, of how far uh, Baltic security has come over the past 16 years. Uh, through a great partnership. And, and indeed, I remember well in that ceremony in the East Room uh, uh, with uh, President Clinton, uh, when he also recognized the important role that uh, the Baltic American communities played in helping to realize that, echoing 
uh, what Paul just said, that that is an, remains an important part of our, uh, our arsenal uh, in countering Russian influence and efforts to uh, subvert um, uh, the sovereignty and, and, uh, and independence of the, of the three Baltic states that, uh, and other states in Central and Eastern Europe where they are very active uh, in other methods uh, uh, and not uh, necessary, and, and as I fully agree with Paul, I don't think the military threat uh, is, the main, is the main concern, although I am going to address what the United States has done uh, through the last uh, several administrations uh, to uh, address that issue, because it is a much more diverse array of threats that, uh, that the Baltic states confront. So I'd like to do two things uh, briefly, and, and uh, we want to leave, since we're a little bit short, uh, of time and, and uh, in the in interest of leaving uh, adequate period for discussion, I want to talk about first of all what's been accomplished, particularly over the last three years. Uh, and here I'll correct some of the record that Kurt Volker uh, suggested about the Obama administration, which I also had the pleasure to, and privilege to serve, uh, and discuss a, a bit more about what the current administration might do, what comes next uh, uh, over the course of the next uh, several years. And as I say, well, I think a lot has been accomplished. It's far too, it's premature to hang the mission accomplished banner and suggest that we can move on uh, and look at other problems uh, in the wider world. So on my first point, let's, let me uh, talk about what's been accomplished. First of all, and, and our, uh, our panel chair uh, touched on some of the uh, uh, remarkable developments we've seen in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the growth of both our security assistance, US security assistance to the Baltic states and other countries in Central and Eastern Europe, but also the uh, uptick in, in our operations and training. Uh, Kurt Volker also alluded to that. Uh, it's really quite remarkable, and it's across a broad spectrum, dealing with very low-level threats, so the so-called hybrid or gray zone threat that you hear about, some of the things that Paul was alluding to, uh, contactless war the Russians talk about. They want to win through the uh, operation of defeating people through their uh, through psychological and other operations uh, to to get to create the sense that perhaps resistance is hopeless or that or their own governments are ineffective and and not addressing their concerns, but nonetheless the United States did move forward uh, very vigorously to uh, to enhance as I mentioned the Baltic Air Policing and its role uh, in 2014 in the face of uh, Russian aggression. Uh, there was a $1 billion uh, European Reassurance Initiative uh, that was launched in 2015 uh, that also enabled the what was called the, and is still, uh, I think, referred to as the persistent U.S. presence, uh, forward presence, operating more regularly in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, you have a, 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 a big number of exercises. Uh, I, I used to, um, in my last position in the National Security Council staff, I used to review these, and it was quite remarkable. A lot of you have heard of some of the big ones, ball tops, the big naval maritime exercise, uh, saber strike that got a lot of attention last summer, which were fairly significant. Uh, some of these are exercises that have gone on for many years that were more focused on, on building partnership capacity and in integration and, and, uh, uh, and uh, interoperability, but they, uh, particularly after uh, the NATO summit last year and, and even before that, took on a much more of a character of reinforcing capacity to undertake collective defense commitment under Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. Um, so, uh, so that was going on. Uh, again, also an uptick in security assistance, quite uh, dramatic. Uh, in 2015, each of the three uh, Baltic states received over $30 million of equipment through these European Reassurance Initiative funding. In 2016, the uh, United States increased the amount of uh, foreign military uh, financing to uh, uh, all three countries to over $9 million, where it had been at about the $3 million level. Uh, and as our chair noted, ERI has uh, more than quadrupled uh, from 2016 to 2017 request, and the uh, expectations is that is going to continue to to go up uh, fairly significantly based on reporting uh, in the newspapers even this week about uh, the administration's uh, 2018 budget. So, um, so I think all of this has been helpful in helping to strengthen defense and security infrastructure to bolster national defense capability of all three countries, to increase NATO operability in the face of both traditional and these uh, non-traditional hybrid threats that I, that I alluded to. But Estonia and Latvia are also, uh, there are other things that uh, may not seem that important and are actually quite small monetarily, but also quite, very important in terms of building uh, integration and capacity. Uh, all three of the Baltic countries receive about uh, 1.2 million annually in international military education and training, which brings their officers and uh, up-and-coming leaders in the military to uh, institutions in the United States. 
We have this very active and successful uh, state partnership program over the last 20 years where Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have collaborated respectively with the Maryland, Michigan, and Pennsylvania National Guard units, which bring together military personnel for training and education and other activities. And here, these kinds of units can deal and help them deal with some of the other kinds of threats that Paul was talking about. I'll give you a great example that I, and I heard uh, President Ilves talk about this uh, um, at a conference in Tallinn last year. The Maryland National Guard has a very active cooperation program. Obviously, you know Maryland sits near Fort, Fort Meade and a national security agency. A lot of people in the Maryland National Guard work for the national security agency. Uh, many of those people are working with their Estonian counterparts. Estonian has this wonderful Center for Excellence uh, on Counter Cyber Threat, the C uh, CC, um, uh, sorry, I'll forget the acronym, but anyway, um, uh, the Center of Excellence. Uh, the, um, uh, so there has been a great deal of cooperation, and actually, I have heard both the Maryland uh, Guard people and, and they've learned from the Estonians. So it's not a one-way transfer of, oh, the big Americans will come and tell you how to do, uh, do these things better. Uh, there's been a real recognition. Uh, and the Maryland National Guard has adopted some of the things that the Estonians were doing. So anyway, this is, um, this is the kind of thing that these relationships that I think are important. And again, the cyber threat, an another part of the kind of effort that Paul was alluding to, the, uh, the, not the direct military, and not that suddenly uh, three battalions uh, or brigades, or, or uh, uh, as the Russians call them, uh, battalion tactical groups, show up on the edges of Tallinn or Riga. Um, and then, of course, lastly, the Warsaw Summit, a very important milestone, I think, and I think you cannot underestimate the importance of this decision last year, uh, which President Obama strongly supported, uh, which was to, uh, and, and the fact that a number of European leaders also, uh, some of whom who might have been seen as waffling, you'll recall the unfortunate comments by the German Foreign Ministry even last year about his concerns about NATO saber rattling. Nonetheless, NATO went ahead and with this enhanced forward presence, uh, at, after the Warsaw Summit, and fortunately all of those units have begun to arrive in the region. Uh, it's, I think, a modest presence. It's, uh, it could it be, and I'll talk about this briefly, could it be larger? Possibly. Is it necessary? I'm not, sh I'm not so sure. I think what is important is, is that it was a visible manifestation that if Russia or any other country thought about crossing the line and attacking the sovereignty, territory, independent, uh, independence, of any of those three governments, that they would be confronting not just the United States periodic rotational forces, not just the forces of the national governments, but they would clearly be confronting a dozen or more NATO states because each of these three multinational battalions that are stationed, uh, UK in, in, in uh, Estonia, uh, the Canadians in Latvia, and the, and the Germans in Lithuania, hugely significant, German forces in Lithuania again, who could have imagined 30 years ago that they would be welcomed in the streets of Vilnius? And yet, what we have now is a situation much like, think back to the Berlin Brigade during the Cold War. We have a capacity that is showing very clearly that if a line is crossed, you will be immediately risking the, uh, a much wider conflagration. And so, if, if Putin or the general staff did one day come to him and say, okay, I'm, t I'm fed up, I'm not gonna take it anymore, and I am gonna choose the military option, he would know that it would be a giant roll of the dice, and that, I think, is not trivial. And this presence, uh, well, it could be larger, as I say, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I'm not so sure that is the big problem. I tend to agree more with Paul that, that uh, there are a much more diverse array of threats that we have to be uh, addressing. And we also have to take into account Russian perceptions of what we're up to, because I can assure you the Russians have a very healthy respect for U.S. force generation capabilities and what we could do if we had a much larger presence particularly in the Baltic states, but even in Poland and, and in Germany. So what more could be done? Uh, as I mentioned, the ERI funding is, is expected to go up again. Um, there, uh, I think there have been concerns about, of course, and President Trump, all the last four or five presidents have always, in fact, it goes back further than that. It goes back to 1979 when we had, Senator Nunn had a proposal when he was in the Senate of a 3% of GDP for defense under the long-term defense program in the 1980s. Um, so NATO, 2% goal, uh, the, the Baltic countries have a, a mixed, a pretty generally positive. Uh, Estonia is meeting the goal, the uh, Lithuanians and Latvians are on the road to meeting that by 2018, 2020. Um, but I think it's very important that, uh, that, that I think the Baltics do have a good story to tell, given their size and capacity, what they have been doing, strengthening their special operations forces and working together with the U.S., working together with each other. Uh, that they're also, and I think, uh, and I can talk a little bit more about this because I was doing a project um, uh, working on this issue of, 
uh, the remarkable uh, developments and capacity that all three countries have made uh, in enhancing their, their National Guard forces, uh, the Kites elite in, uh, in, in Estonia, which have been well established, but also the decisions of the Latvian government and, uh, and also the Lithuanian government to boost their National Guard forces, the Zemzrade, uh, and the KSAP uh, in, uh, in Lithuania. Uh, and very important capabilities, and capabilities that are, that are ready to deal with the kind of incidents and support civil authorities and the kind of incidents that Paul was suggesting. You know, the FSB officer goes across and rapes someone and then there's a riot, uh, up to the idea of supporting NATO forward follow-on forces coming to, you know, to, uh, uh, to defend their, uh, uh, you know, to defend their territory. So I think the, the, uh, the development of those is a very good story to tell and I think one that I hope uh, that uh, the Trump administrations and people around it will, will take notice of. And I do know that some people, at least in the Pentagon, are quite well aware of this and are looking at ways in which they can continue to help those capabilities develop because I do think those uh, territorial defense and, uh, and unconventional warfare and civilian resilience capabilities, and some of you of course have seen the famous Lithuanian manual on civil defense, all of which, you know, what to do with little green men show up. I think all of these things are a positive thing that the European, uh, that the three Baltic countries are doing. So um, let, me, uh, let me just wrap up. Okay, what, could, what, what more could be done? Well, I have to say since I work presently at the RAND Corporation uh, over the last 16 months, before I got there, some of my colleagues were engaged in a series of war games, which I know a number of you, certainly the officials in the room, know well about, which suggested that, well, what NATO really needs to, to have a credible, quote unquote, d d conventional deterrence uh, in the Baltic states would be not three battalions, but more like three to four brigades. So a much larger force, really, essentially almost tripling that, that force that is now presently uh, being deployed. Uh, and that would be a, a more credible one, at least in terms of the strict correlation of forces that the Russian general staff might look at, that that would provide the capability that the Russians couldn't think that they could if, if the general staff woke up one day and said, Vladimir, we can actually have a, a, a coup de main, we can have a fait accompli, we can be in Tallinn and Riga by uh, breakfast tomorrow. Uh, well, that this kind of a force would be much more capable. Well, Again, I believe that even the existing force, and if the Russians did want to go that route, but if even the existing force would present him with some of the same, well, it certainly could be dealt with much more effectively if the Russians you know, moved out of a major exercise uh, uh, that it, it would not be able to offer the kind of resistance that the other force that I'm talking about. But, but again, I don't know that that's necessary. And we have to consider how would the Russians view this and would it also ratchet up the tensions? What other responses would they take on the perspective that not that not that that threat that enhanced NATO presence in and of itself was a threat to them, but what would the United States do? You'll hear the Russians talk about what they really worry about is they worry about the buildup of NATO infrastructure that could be used for power projection against them. So the notion, what the Russian nightmare is that we sometimes, and if you've been to Germany and the Rhine Main Air Base, enormous facility for moving military equipment all around the world. Their nightmare is that one day they wake up five years from now, ten years from now, and there's Rhine mines all around them in, in, uh, in the Baltics, in central Poland and elsewhere, and the notion that, that they could be uh, subject to attack. So we don't want to play to that fear, but I, I think we want to have a credible deterrent. We want to have capacity to deal with a range of threats, but I don't think we want to go down that route. And as I said in my opening remarks, uh, choosing the military option is a huge roll of the dice for, for Putin. Uh, and I think we have to be as concerned and maybe even more concerned about this, uh, this contactless war. Uh, I heard everywhere I went in the Baltics last year about the daily war that, the, and Morris can talk about this, I won't get into his, uh, perhaps what he might address, but the daily war of ideas that's underway uh, through Russian trolls, through <coughs> information operations, through Russian media, <coughs> Russian language television, trying to create the sense that somehow they, that defense of the Baltics is hopeless, that the Baltic governments are corrupt and ineffective, and that, and that everything is perfect in Russia, and the West is in decay and decline. So that is the, that is the war that we have to be winning daily, uh, along with, of course, as we saw just this last week, uh, the cyber war that, uh, that is uh, that even more imminent. So I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much uh, for this possibility. It's good, <coughs> good to be back at J Bank conference after years. Um, to address the, the title of this panel, um, 
U.S. Baltic relations implications for security, I think it's enough to give the answer in one word, immense. But um, I will not follow this uh, quite a modern trend in political debate these days to just provide simple answers to complex issues without much of explanation. Um, indeed, if we are looking at the situation in different regions in the world, uh, one can notice that, uh, that the challenges are there, uh, non-proliferation, terrorism, instabilities in different regions, regional conflicts, um, aggressive behavior of uh, states possessing uh, quite uh, impressive military tools. Those are just a few examples. Um, and, and some of those challenges I mentioned just now uh, are those we are facing on, on European continent. Well, perhaps, uh, I mean, this is just to underline that the situation indeed is complex, and perhaps uh, the human beings have this tendency to describe that, that these days we are living in are the most complex, but I think that this, in, in, in these days indeed uh, this is true. Uh, perhaps I will um, provide a couple of points uh, as a kickoff for today's um, uh, debate on, on, on this topic. Perhaps the first one is that one cannot um, separate security of the Baltic states from the security of the rest of Europe and, and the security of the United States. And not just because um, we, European Union and the United States, are the biggest trading partners, but because we share the same fundamental values, we share the same fundamental principles, uh, rule of law. And as Ambassador Volker mentioned earlier today, if those fundamental values and principles are challenged in one place, it's not long before those uh, values will be challenged in other places as well. Uh, secondly, um, if you look back at the history of the last century, we clearly see that American involvement in European security is, is fundamental. And again, not going into details about the painful history of European continent of the last century, we know that with active American involvement, uh, the bloody wars have been ended, and uh, the Iron Curtain was brought down. As everybody knows in this audience uh, for, for Baltic states, the, the road to regain our freedom and independence perhaps was uh, a little bit less fortunate. Uh, it was more than 50 years of occupation, and only after collapse of Soviet Union, um, the idea of Europe whole, free, and at peace uh, transformed into reality. Um, but it needs to be noted that already then, it was in 1994, one of the most outspoken European leaders at that time, Prime Minister of Sweden, Karl Bildt, wrote a nice article, the Baltic litmus test. And, um, and I have to quote him, our good friend Karl. He wrote in 94 that security concerns of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania will test the readiness and ability of the United States to influence Russia's policy and contribute to the new security order. That was in 94. And I think looking back to the last 25 years, we can say that US administrations have passed this test. Well, of course, we can find some ups and downs, but in general terms, as we see in our countries, um, and as we felt in our countries during, during those years, uh, the support coming from US administration was extremely important and strong. Just a couple of examples. Uh, withdrawal of Russian troops from our soil uh, in early 90s, termination of OEC monitoring mission in Estonia and Latvia. Uh, it might seem quite a technical issue, but uh, without that, our further integration into Western organizations like European Union and NATO wouldn't be possible. Uh, last but not least, active contribution to the process of integration into the NATO. And remember, in 97, 98, after Madrid, NATO Madrid summit, when our membership into NATO was quite a distant um, 
target uh, US, US administration came forward with an idea to, to sign US Baltic Charter, and we did so in, I think, in January 98. I was uh, fortunate enough to to have um, this Latvian delegation during those negotiations. And those were very nice negotiations because uh, those were negotiations not like conventional ones when the people are confronting with different views each other and trying to to achieve maximum for your own uh, interests. We were basically sitting at the same time of the table and, and trying to define what are American interests into the security of the Baltic states. So in 98, American administration committed to the security of our uh, countries in Baltics, and that was extremely important uh, that that commitment was strong, was kept strong till the 2004, our full-fledged membership into a North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Um, at the same time, from our side, I think, we also provided certain um, or, or made certain important steps demonstrating that this is not just a one-way street. We pursued very actively uh, our reforms forward. We participated actively into US-led efforts to bring uh, peace and stability in different regions, be it in Iraq, be it in Afghanistan, be it in Balkans or elsewhere, not just politically, but also militarily with, with sweat and blood of our soldiers. Um, but in 2008, uh, everybody witnessed that the road to the Europe all free and at peace is, is a bit bumpy sometimes. Uh, that was uh, uh, August 2008 uh, when uh, Russian Federation decided to challenge the borders of neighboring sovereign countries uh, for the first time after the collapse of the Soviet Union or after the end of uh, Cold War. Uh, violating the borders of um, Georgian Republic. Uh, sadly, at that time, most of Western powers didn't listen to the voices coming from Baltic states and Poland, saying that this is not just about uh, an unfortunate episode in, in the modern history. This is about a potentially new serious security risks for democratic society as a whole. So we were back to business as usual pretty soon. Uh, and perhaps only in 2014, um, events in Crimea, annexation of Crimea, and then military adventure in uh, eastern Ukraine became a real game changer. I was at that time at NATO headquarters as Latin permanent representative. and. Um, I can tell you that it was really a game changer, but when it comes to political decisions, when it comes to military decisions, then uh, to achieve consensus was not that easy either. Um, and I have to say that I was a witness to see that American administration with their strong voice on both uh, political and also military levels was decisive to, to iron um, consensus decisions in, in, in Wales, Wales and Warsaw summits. It was American general, Sakyor Phil Breedlow, who wrote, I think, extremely important piece on describing what the current military challenges uh, might, uh, we, we have to face uh, uh, in, 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 uh, in NATO alliance uh, dealing with uh, Russian military buildup, with snap exercises, uh, and I would say that this letter of uh, that time, Sakior General Bridlow, was uh, extremely important to, to, to arrive later um, at the political level to the decisions in Warsaw and, and, and the world. <coughs> now, as we speak, our security, I think, rests on, on those decisions, our security in Baltic states. Um, war deterrence, when I arrived at NATO in 2011, was uh, perhaps within the framework of uh, polit uh, diplomatic and political impoliteness. When I departed in 2015, everybody was talking about deterrence. And I think that everybody has to recognize that deterrence basically rests on two, two elements. One is about uh, military capabilities, and I think a lot has been done during last years, including 
uh, enhanced forward presence and uh, including uh, military spending or better to say military investment. Um, we in Latvia uh, are following very closely to the decision of our parliament to increase our, our military investment till 2% of GDP uh, by 2018, next year. Uh, we recognize that everybody has to uh, pay its share. Uh, but second, uh, perhaps uh, element of the same importance is political resolve. Um, so far, I think we have heard from uh, different officials of the new administration, including um, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, uh, National Security Advisor, uh, Vice President, um, very clear messages uh, in, in, in different frameworks about uh, U.S. administration's commitment to, to NATO, to Article 5. Uh, I think now everybody holds breath in Europe, waiting for President Trump's first meeting with, uh, with NATO allies uh, next week in Brussels. Um, I think this is what everybody really follows and, and, and is waiting for, a clear commitment about Article 5, importance of Article 5, um, I think symbolically, uh, during his visit, um, as far as I know, uh, the monument will be inaugurated in front of the new uh, NATO headquarters, 9-11 um, uh, monument, uh, and this is the only time when NATO alliance invoked Article 5, uh, when America was attacked by uh, terrorists back in the early 90s. So, um, this is the current situation, uh, and I would say uh, that we are perhaps back to the 1994 Carl Bildt's uh, message about the Baltic Coast test. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you. So, uh, the, uh, Henry. <laughs> Mr. Goebel says I'm one of the old timers, and I've been to many conferences and agree heart and brain it with everything he says. But I'm also old enough to have the Eastern paranoia. NATO is still a political animal. We still have to put our faith and hope and blood into the NATO will come to our aid. I served the NATO in France, and in those days, we didn't know which side France was going to be on. And if we get this Eastern paranoia, the same thing is with NATO today. I also remember not the Eastern Front worried about, but the Southern and Western Front of Lithuania. I'm a Lithuanian. Kaliningrad sits there. And I also remember World War II days, the fifth column. NATO doesn't do anything about Kaliningrad. They're supposed to have more tanks than all of NATO have in that one little enclave. Can you relieve my Eastern paranoia and tell me, make me feel better? No, no, it's worse than you think. <laughs> and it's worse than you think because the attacks that are being directed from our friends in the Kremlin are without any of those tanks having to move. Uh, I, I would like to see Russia dismembered because I think it's the only thing that will help us and it, it is an empire and it should be dismembered further. Having said that, I think there's very little stomach for a serious policy of containment because I don't think containment and deterrence are understood properly. The world that George Kennan was writing about was one where a government could not reach into other societies via the internet and the media the way they can now. It was a, a world in which no government, including that of Joseph Stalin, made use of massive amounts of corrupt money to corrupt other political systems. There was small amounts. I mean, the, the thing during the Cold War was that everyone knew that if you went to spy for the Soviets, you'd better believe in them because they weren't going to pay you off. Now you don't have to believe in anything except the value of the dollar because they've got lots of them and they'll use them. I don't think history is over. I think the one thing that uh, was sad about a lot that happened in 91 and then in 2004 is a lot of people in the West decided history was over for this part of the world. I think borders probably will change over the next 100 years. I don't think we're going to sit where we are today. But I would argue that the survival and vitality 
of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania is at least equally dependent on how those countries act to their own populations and interact with Europe and us as it is on how many Western troops are there. I, 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 I'm just convinced of that. I believe that to the extent that the Russian uh, organized criminal state can penetrate the banking system, can pay off politicians, can use cyber war in various ways, are threats that have to be addressed because those are much more immediate. If, uh, only if, those threats are ignored and they go on for time, will you have the question of the use of military? The, the, I, I really don't believe the Kremlin is planning to send troops in now. That doesn't mean they may not send troops in eventually after these other things happen. Please look at what happened in Georgia in 2008 and what happened in Ukraine in 2014. While the West, and in, in particular the United States, ignored all of it, our Russian friends were busily subverting both of those countries long before any troops moved. And unfortunately, the governments in place in Tbilisi and in Kiev did not have either the focus or the wherewithal or the will to take steps domestically that might have made it impossible for the Russians to move. If Estonia, if Tallinn, Riga, and Vilnius do not take steps to solve some of these problems of corruption and media penetration, that will have more to do about whether Russians will move than whether there's a NATO presence there. I'm in favor of having a NATO base right in Narva. I, I've always felt that way. I've said that in 91. Having said that, that doesn't solve the problem. And if it, it's, it's a mistake to assume in this, in, in the, given the nature of the enemy we face, who uses a variety of tactics to focus exclusively on one means of bringing history to an end because it won't work. We should, we should have learned that, but the models we're drawing on, and I, I must say, the, the current fashion of using the word containment, uh, I just did a, a pretty good sized essay on this. Look at the world that George Kennan was describing in 1945, and look at the world now, and what it was possible, what containment could mean in 1945-46, and what it would require now are fundamentally different things. If we, had, if, if we adopted strictly what Kennan said we should do, we'd lose right now. Maris, I think you had. Yeah, yeah I just uh, perhaps, uh, not, you know, in say, contradicting to what, uh, what, what Paul mentioned, but I, well, I have some comments. One about the, this, this uh, uh, fifth column and, 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 and what is the situation and what is the, the reaction from NATO. This is about resilience, and resilience is considered, first of all, the responsibility of national states. There is not very much what NATO can do about uh, creating uh, societies which believe to the statehood, to the prosperity, to the future. I think that was the, the, the most important reason why Russians used the uh, weakness of Ukrainian state back in 2014 invading Crimea because Ukrainian state was extremely weak. There was no trust of the general population to, uh, to, to the government activities. The, 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 the army was weak, corruption, etc., etc. So this is, first of all, responsibility of national states. And I think we in Baltics, we know that. Uh, we are, if I may so, say so, under this hybrid pressure, uh, including massive propaganda from our eastern neighbors, uh, we are under this situation since mid-90s. So this is nothing new to us. Um, I would be very cautious in making any comparisons between situation in Ukraine and situation in, in Baltic states, be it in Narva or Daugopils or green little men appearing on our streets because, because uh, the situation in Crimea also legally, from the legal point of view, is absolutely different, not only because we are members uh, of NATO, they are not, but also because uh, according to that time, uh, international agreements, Russians had the, the rights to keep up to 20,000 uh, military forces on, on Crimean Peninsula. 
So, and they've been able to play with that uh, in front of international media. Who are they? Are they somebody, uh, in, uh, new arrivals from, from the Russian mainland, or are those uh, the people uh, being there on the basis of international uh, agreement? And, and the final one, uh, uh, I mean, this scenario on, um, on fake, uh, fake uh, Narva rape, or whatever you call it, um, um, I think that uh, it's not that easy because in order to sell this scenario, especially within international organizations, you have to have people listening to you and, and, and people who believe that this fake story is true. And I have to say that the general trust into what Russian authorities are saying has eroded. I mean, their activities in Ukraine, their, 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 their public statements in, 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 in months to come um, after uh, Crimea's annexation, has a rope, and, and Ambassador Walker mentioned about uh, the dramatic change in the public attitude in Germany, in the, Ger in, in the country which was extremely positive towards assisting Russia with different programs, be it European Union framework programs of modernization, etc., etc., bringing them to the G8 table, bringing them into the Council of Europe membership uh, status. Um, even in Germany, the attitude towards the Russian I mean, how much you can trust what they are saying has changed dramatically. So uh, I think we have to keep that in mind. We cannot neglect the possibility of the different provocations, but I think we have to keep it as a sober mind. Stephen, do you want to say anything? Or, okay, uh, next question. Uh, your first one up with the, sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. sorry, he's, he's a new guy. I have it written down, so I, I promise it's, it's a brief comment, but it's going to be followed by a question because I'm trying to be organized. Uh, I'm an uh, American of Latvian descent, fluent in, fluent in Latvian. I'm also a, an attorney that's worked in global anti-money laundering for the past 16 years, uh, since 9-11. Uh, Paul is, Paul Global is 100% correct. There is corruption and corrupt money flowing out of Russia in tremendous tremendous quantities. Goes through a lot of countries. Goes through Latvia, too. I've uh, been to Latvia and here. I've met with law enforcement. I've met with prosecutors and even Latvian ministers here and there who are interested in hindering the flow of illegal money, Russian money, through Latvia. Their laws are good. On paper, they're just as good as ours. The key is enforcement. Their law enforcement has improved tremendously over the past two years. However, I've got two observations. Number one, they're tremendously under-resourced. Their prosecutors, their anti-money laundering regulators, uh, they could use a lot more resources for what they're expected to do. Uh, second, they're good, but they're not as professional as the FBI, U.S. prosecutors, U.S. regulators. They could use some training. And my question to the panel is, how do you think the U.S. can help? Uh, I, I'm not aware, I'm, I'm not following our current programs, but this was actually a, a major part, uh, and you may know this uh, yourself, I know Paul does and Mars certainly, uh, that this was a major part of our early engagement with uh, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. Uh, uh, helping them to gain better control of their banking systems and, and financial regulations, and uh, this was a, a very important part of uh, assistance that was under the, under the so-called seed uh, funding at that time in the 1990s, support East European democracies. Um, I don't know how that's continued. I'm I'm, I'm sure um, I wish you probably could speak more to this than I, but I but I do know that was something that even uh, you know this wasn't a new problem, and indeed maybe it was even. Worse before, as as those three governments uh, enhance their own governance and uh, and financial regulations. But uh. well, I, I think that uh, this is a very valid uh, point. Um, uh, and as you mentioned, the, the progress has been made quite significant one uh, over the last uh, couple of years. And and as a um, as a result, uh, Latvia just recently joined uh, the OEC organization. Uh, OECD, sorry, um, <laughs> these abbreviations. So, uh, 
which, um, I mean, and, and in this process, our system laws and also implementation has been scrutinized uh, pretty heavily. Uh, you are right, uh, the resources, I think, that's my personal view. Uh, I'm not in, in, I'm a member of cabinet anymore, uh, so it's not within my responsibilities, but I understand that, uh, that the resources still are, uh, are, are lacking. Uh, I would say that if you ask what U.S. government can do, uh, I would say training training expertise uh, because uh, some of those uh, cases are, are pretty uh, complex and, and, uh, and difficult to, to, to follow the trace of the money. But on this kind of side remark, uh, pretty much we have spoken about Russian oligarchs. Most probably they are also using our banking sector. But if you look at European map, I think the, the, the main residence of Russian oligarchs is not Tallinn, Riga or Vilnius, but this is London. Three quick points. First, Russian corruption has been around for a long time, but the Russian corruption of the 1990s and the Russian corruption of now is fundamentally different. Not only is it different by a factor of at least 10 in terms of size, but because of it's much more involved, by, it's much more state directed. <laughs> Under Yeltsin, all kinds of people who were corrupt pursued their own specific goals. Now, the corruption is mostly state directed and that's far more dangerous because it's used against uh, NGOs and other organizations and state institutions uh, because that's what Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin wants. Okay, that's a big change. Second, uh, the process of training prosecutors and investigators is something that should always have gone on. One of the problems was that early on there was a tendency in this country anyway to assume that people knew more than they did. That uh, we, I resigned from one Baltic uh, uh, organization because they took money to provide a course of instruction in the early years on gender inequality in the workplace. And I said it was irresponsible to do that at that time given all the other problems that were faced. There was an unwillingness to admit just how deep and how serious the problem was and how hard it would be to overcome because you over did. And third, and this I want, to, I want to completely agree with what's just been said, the level of Russian corruption in the West is so staggeringly high and so open and so completely denied. The reason we do not impose personal sanctions on Vladimir Putin, despite his criminal activity, despite his aggression, is because the Swiss banking system doesn't want to take the risk of losing the money that he has directed into their accounts. Now, that, what that means, of course, is that the problem in Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania is a serious one that Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania have to address. But it is not a problem that Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania can solve on their own, especially if there are all kinds of other ways for this corrupt money to flow. And I think we have got to, at first, first we have to admit the, the, the nature and extent of the problem. And then, and only then, can we begin to think in long enough terms. But I remember when I worked at the State Department, uh, the last time, certainly, um, that I was told that long-term planning was worrying about what was going to be on the, the TV news that night and strategic long-term planning was worrying about what was going to be on the Sunday talk show. And there is a short-term mentality in this town, which means that people want to declare victory quickly. And there was a lot of victor, uh, declaring victory in 91 and again in 2004, you know, as if it was over. Well, this is a challenge that's for probably forever. It certainly is forever until we get a very different regime uh, in Moscow. And our final question slash comment will be from the uh, Latvian ambassador, sir. Yeah, well, indeed, uh, a, a little comment to uh, to the previous previous question and, and comment. What what can a U.S. do? Well, I think while the things are not as bad, just um, during last years. Well, our banking supervisory institution has tripled its staff. It's not, not as bad with resources. Well, it has tripled its staff. It has 
rather significantly changed the policy of supervision of banks. Millions and millions of fines have been imposed on few Latvian banks because of dubious transactions. Last year, uh, 15 Latvian banks went over very fundamental audit, very fundamental scrutiny of all the range of uh, banking activities uh, made by American audit companies uh, according to American standards, well, to fit both American and European standards. Well, I think the changes uh, have taken place very significantly during last year. And today, Latvian government, together with Banking Association, together with uh, banking supervision uh, organization with Treasury, with, with American institutions, is working very, very uh, closely to improve the situation. It doesn't mean we are, we are going to depart from Russian clients. Well, uh, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't argue that all the Russian, Russian clients keeping their accounts in Latvian banks are corrupt or, or criminals. Not at all. Well, they do feel safer on European territory keeping their money than to keep, keep their money in Russia. Th that's, that's normal. But, well, we need, and that's what we are doing, improve the whole system of supervision of, well, dubious transactions, dubious banking activities, and impose a real uh, and efficient supervision. That's what's happening now. And, and, and here, I think we, we are working so closely with uh, American institutions uh, than never, ever. Okay, thank you, Ambassador. I'd like to thank our uh, three speakers for uh, providing a very informative and uh, lively uh, discussion. And as Carl said, we're just gonna go right into panel two, which is info and cyber war update. And if you wanna get coffee during the time, fine, but I guess uh, whoever's kind of be coming up to moderate and as the speakers, please come up now. Thank you. Hi folks, we're just going to get going in a couple of minutes. I'd be more than happy to have Paul join us for our disinformation panel. One of his, one of his generals <laughs> lined up all of his soldiers along the border. Napoleon said, what are you planning to have them do? Collect tariffs? 
we can have up all the American troops we want in Eastern Estonia, Eastern Latvia, and, and West Germany. That's right. Now. Guess what? The Russians will just go over. The disinformation panel will begin in 120 seconds. I'd ask that our panelists, Jessica, Marius, and, and if Liz is here, if you could uh, come up.
Okay, folks, I think we're going to get started with the information war panel. So my name is uh, Markus Golga. I'm, uh, I'm from Canada, and I've been uh, dealing with Baltic issues and certainly information warfare issues for, for quite some time, as a lot of people in this room have. Um, I want to start off by thanking Carl and, uh, and J-Bank for the amazing work that they've been doing for the past, you know, decades. Uh, but really, over the past, uh, over the past uh, 10 years, when I've, I've been involved with, uh, with J-Bank and worked with Carl, it's, it's just amazing. Um, we rely so much on the work that the Latvian, Lithuanian, and Estonian communities do in the U.S., I mean, in Canada, we don't have too much influence, but what you're doing here is really important, and, and uh, I hope that you keep up the, the, the great work. Um, and I'd, just on a personal note, I'd like to thank Paul Goebel. Um, he is an amazing asset for us. Um, he's a uh, one-man counter-propaganda machine. All of the writing that he does, I, I don't know how he does it. I think he puts out five to six pieces every single day. So. I want to thank him for that, and, and um, in fact, what he was talking about um, with non-kinetic warfare being really the Russians understanding that this is the, the, the future um, and using uh, propaganda, um, psychological operations, uh, the Kremlin understands it. Um, this is a cheap way to change regimes, to change the way people think in the, in the near abroad, instead of using uh, tanks and bullets. But this sort of warfare is not, it's nothing new for us. We've been dealing with this stuff since, um, you know, the 90s. Um, certainly after the bronze soldier, um, the modern sort of era of information wars sort of ramped up. I, in Finland, this has been going on with a gentleman named Johan Backman, um, who some of you may be familiar with here. Um, he's a particularly insidious propagandist. Um, he's been uh, denying the occupation of the Baltic states, um, the deportations ever since, I think around 2007, 2008. And he continues to do so. Um, I think his latest role is the ambassador to the occupied areas of Eastern Ukraine and such. Um, in Canada as well, just to give you a little bit of information, I mean, little Canada, I think all of you sort of probably recognize Canada as a as a very peaceful uh, nation living in the sort of attic of North America. We sometimes come out and we're very friendly and, and such. Um, we're really getting targeted right now as well. This is really ramping up. Um, I had a meeting with a very high profile uh, national uh, politician uh, just last week. And we were talking about the information war and what's going on in the Baltic states. He said, well, this is, this is incredible, this information war. It's, it's all brand new. And I said, no, no it's not. Remember, I warned you about this, and we all warned you about this already in 2008, 2009. This is nothing new. So they're only waking up, at least in Canada, and I think the United States is finally waking up again to di disinformation, um, disinformation right now. But they haven't really made any plans to combat it, at least in Canada. So what we're seeing, especially with this new uh, uh, enhanced forward presence um, uh, that, that Canada has the role in, in Latvia. We're seeing new headlines coming out in, in November. Uh, one of our national newspapers ran an article written by a, uh, a freelance uh, writer in Latvia. I don't know how they, they found this guy. Uh, the headline was that Latvians don't need Canada's presence uh, in their country, and they don't need NATO either. There's no, nothing to worry about, everything is fine. Um, we know that's not the case. Um, things ramped up uh, about a month later where the Russian ambassador in Canada wrote an opinion piece where he wrote that Canada has no business uh, being in the Baltic states. Uh, again, Russia poses no threat. Uh, and then if Canada wants to re-engage with Russia, which was our policy for the past year and now things have thankfully changed, um, that it can't put its troops in, in Latvia. The last thing that the ambassador said was that uh, Canada's role in the Baltics should be to facilitate a meeting between the United States and Russia to create a modern day new Yalta agreement. 
So this is, uh, this is part of the Russian propaganda that's happening right now. And the latest piece was our defense minister, who happens to be a Sikh. Um, he wears a turban. Um, the Russian propaganda media put out articles in Latvia connecting him to uh, Muslim extremism and that we ha now have a, a, a Muslim uh, minister who's placing his troops in Latvia. So this sort of thing is just getting ramped up it's, and, and there's more of it coming. I'm hoping that the Canadian government uh, will, uh, will do more to counter that and the US government as well. Um, I'm going to now introduce our speakers and we have a great panel here today. Um, Jessica Otto um, from Finland, she'll be our first presenter. Uh, Jessica is an investigative reporter with ULE Kioski, the social media product of the, the Finnish broadcasting company ULE, that's the national broadcaster in Finland. She specializes in Russia, I Russian information warfare and extre in extremism. Uh, currently, Jessica is writing an investigative book about Russia's information warfare. Um, Jessica, if you don't know, is I think the Kremlin's biggest sort of, or greatest punching bag sort of in Finland. She, I've never seen anyone trolled so much and abused so much uh, in the media and she's an absolute hero standing up for, for truth in, in Finland because it's not always easy in that country. Um, so thanks Jessica for being here. Um, and our second panelist will be Marius Laurinovicius. Uh, Marius is the Baltic American Freedom Foundation Security Research Fellow, currently in residence at Hudson Institute. His study areas include Russian domestic and foreign policy, Putin's kleptocracy, information wars, and security in the Baltic region. Uh, Marius is considered to be one of the leading experts on Russia in Lithuania and has received several awards for his contributions to Lithuanian foreign policy. Thanks, Marius, for being with us. And Liz Wall, I have a great story actually about Liz. Liz and I were on a panel two years ago, I think, on the same issue at, at the J-Bank conference. Just a couple of days before the conference, I published an article about a, uh, a, a Russian-Ukrainian pianist named uh, Valentina Lizitsa, who is a, a pianist, a very successful concert pianist by day, but by night she's a, a, Kremlinist, a Kremlin propagandist. Uh, and she controls a, a vast number of trolls. Um, and I wrote an article comparing uh, Valentina Lizitsa to um, a Nazi era pianist named um, uh, El Elie Ney, uh, who was a member of the Nazi party at the time. Um, I published the article and two days later, just as I was coming to Washington, the, the Kremlin troll army sort of just came after me and there were thousands of them who were uh, attacking my, uh, my Twitter feed. And I asked Liz, I said, how did you deal with it? Because Liz has been dealing with this for, for a number of years. And, and Liz's comment was, the block button is your friend. And so I spent the entire conference just blocking these, these <laughs> trolls. And I just wanted to thank Liz for that wonderful advice. Um, Liz is an American journalist based in Washington, DC. Uh, she has provided on-air analysis and appeared on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and several international news outlets, outlets and documentaries. From 2011 to 2014, she was a correspondent and the anchor for the US branch of RTTV and made international headlines following her resignation from that channel. Thanks, Liz, for being here. And so I'm gonna ask Jessica to come up. She's going to present first. I'm gonna turn off the live stream for this, but it will be back on once Jessica's completed. Thank you so much. And thank you, Carl, for inviting me here. It's really an honor.
online privilege. And uh, as well, taking this opportunity, I would like to thank uh, Baltic American Freedom Foundation, which is not only one of the sponsors of uh, today's event, but uh, they provided an opportunity uh, to me to be here, not only today, but for two years here in DC um, on sponsorship, uh, well, on scholarship sponsored by them. Uh, so really, thank you. Thank you, Laura. And uh, I will do a little different thing. I will try to break rules and will not make any update because it's, uh, our title is uh, Update on Info and Cyber Warfare uh, 2017. So you have heard uh, one type of update and I'm sure you will uh, here the other one from Liz. So I will try to break rules and will not make any update. I will bring you back to the Cold War. And I have two reasons for doing that. Uh, the first one is uh, to convey a message which I have been conveying, I should say, at least for five years. And at the very beginning, uh, I, was go I, I was called paranoid. Uh, now, some of the people listen to it, but, but not <coughs> many still agree. The thing is that the message is that we are at war. We're talking about uh, information warfare, cyber uh, warfare, hybrid warfare, any energy war uh, waged against, against Europe by Russia. But when it comes to a kind of generalization and not only saying but admitting to ourselves that we are at war, we're still reluctant to do that. Uh, and I can understand why it's so. Uh, because we in the West, uh, we don't want to be back uh, in any war, Cold War or any other war. Um, but here I would like to paraphrase uh, a famous saying by one of the leaders of Bolsheviks, Trotsky, which would be, uh, you might not be interested in, in a war, but Putin's regime is interested in a war with you. So when somebody is at war with you, you are automatically at war with somebody. And uh, why I'm talking about the Cold War, it's not because I believe that situation in uh, the world is the same. Absolutely not. Situation has changed, and that's why we will not have a new Cold War any longer. Uh, but the reason is that the war Russia wages against us is very, very similar to the one they waged against uh, us. And I mean not the Baltic states, uh, not Ukraine, or any other country in near abroad. I mean uh, the West uh, as uh, the West general. So it's a very complex war. And it's very similar to the one we face now. And the other reason why I'm talking to, uh, about that is uh, that before making any updates, it's critical to look back at the history. And uh, that would help us to understand what we're dealing with. So to begin with, um, I don't like uh, the terms we use. Neither information warfare nor cyber warfare or hybrid warfare. Uh, and the reason for this is that it's not the terms Russians use. And terms really matter 
because when let's say we uh, we talk about hybrid warfare, it's a Western concept. Uh, have nine steps. Uh, well, I believe most of you are aware of, of that. But the thing is that when it comes to uh, Putin's regime or KGB strategy, uh, they can use uh, the first and the ninth step at the same time. So their concept is simply different. Uh, that's why I would like to use their terms. And their terms, uh, when, when it comes to the things we're talking today, uh, there are three main terms they use for uh, describing that. It's active measures, disinformation, and subversion. So um, when it comes to active measures, the one thing uh, we should, or maybe the best example would be the interference uh, of uh, Russian regime into US presidential campaign. Is it just about cyber warfare? I mean, DNA, uh, DNC hacking? Not only. Is it only about uh, information warfare? Uh, yes, it's about fake news, but again, not only. Uh, as uh, one working with a uh, kleptocracy initiative just currently at the Hudson Institute, I would say it involves uh, kleptocratic means as well. And we already heard today about um, the corruption dimension in Russian warfare against us. So I would say uh, this interference into US elections uh, definitely has uh, this kleptocratic dimension as well. So it's a complex. Uh, disinformation. The best example would be uh, the famous Lisa case in, uh, in Germany. We've already talked about some uh, potential scenarios of raping uh, Russian girl in, in Estonia. Uh, so uh, I'm absolutely sure most of you are aware about this famous case of, of fake rape of, of German girl in, in Germany, Russian girl in Germany, Lisa case. Uh, but again, it's uh, not just about some uh, spreading narrative. It's about uh, creating a story, fake story. It's, it's, it's slightly different thing, thing from what we understand or expect having our own mindset from our adversary. Uh, subversion. Uh, we talk uh, a lot about the influence of uh, such media outlets like uh, RT, Sputnik, or Russian media, uh, Russian TV channels in the Baltic states. My argument would be it's not so much about uh, propaganda. It's much more about subversion. And the main goal of these media outlets is not to portray Putin as a good guy or Russia as a good country. The main uh, goal is to, uh, the main goal is spreading distrust in our own societies. And that is the main form of subversion. But looking back at uh, what they did uh, during the Cold War, and what is absolutely similar to the things we face now. So let's take fake news. We believe that it's a kind of new phenomena <coughs> developed by Putin's regime just recently. Uh, it was rightly said that Baltic states uh, have experienced that 
for many, many years already. But not only about that. Uh, I, will, I will give you three main examples of fake news of the Cold War. Uh, there are many, many others, but I will just, I have chosen just three. So the first one is uh, about Pope uh, Pius XII, which was portrayed as a Nazi collaborator. And now we know that from, it's, it's, it's not about any conspiracy theories, it is documented from, from very reliable sources, that it was a huge uh, KGB operation to uh, portray Pius Pope XII, uh, Pope Pius XII as an escort co collaborator. That's a fake news. Uh, HIV invented by CIA. I really believe most of you remember this kind of uh, fake news. Again, it's documented. It was done by KGB. Uh, the famous theory of nuclear winter, the same story. That was invented by KGB. Um, we're talking about a lot and discussing uh, how Russia at least manipulate uh, WikiLeaks. I would choose uh, stronger words, but, but still. Uh, but how many of us um, do remember very similar example from 1970s and 80s? In 1978, uh, the outlet called Covert Action Information Bulletin was founded. Uh, the founder of the bulletin was Philip A.G., former CIA agent. At that time, many people, uh, like many people now thinking about uh, Julian Assange, they thought that he was just whistleblower and doing the right thing, like many people still think about WikiLeaks and, and Julian Assange. But when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed and uh, when we've got, uh, let's say, Metrokin arch archives, and it was confirmed by uh, famous KGB defector Oleg Kalugin, we learned that this whistleblower, Philip A.G., was an actual KGB agent. Uh, again, hacking of DNC. Uh, the new thing? Yes and no. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, this story about how they portrayed uh, Pope Pius XII as a Nazi collaborator. So one thing they used for that, uh, they uh, tried to access Vatican archives. And that was, uh, they set a huge KGB operation for that. They used Bulgaria, not, not uh, Soviet Union as, as such, but their ally in the Soviet bloc, Bulgaria, for that. So again, they're using stolen information all the time, and it's nothing so much new. So um, to, uh, to wrap up, um, I, will, I would offer three major takeaways uh, about these things. The first one, uh, we should admit that we are at war, and it's a really most important thing. And we should admit that this war is a complex one uh, where one thing is simply inseparable from the other one. And uh, we should learn from the history to know what uh, we're dealing with. Because, uh, and it would be the last point, because we should always remember that this regime, I mean Putin's regime, doesn't uh, appear from nowhere. 
It's the same KGB regime we faced in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Thank you. Thanks, Marius. Lots to, uh, lots to think about and, and look back on, reflect upon with uh, Soviet active measures and to see how they correlate with, with today's. Liz, please. Thank you, Marcus, and uh, thanks to JBank for hosting this event and to bringing attention again to this topic of cyber warfare and information warfare, which has become even more relevant um, since I was here two years ago. I was on actually the same panel two years ago. And um, since then, this issue has truly gone global. Um, back then, I knew that disinformation was damaging and dangerous, but uh, did not predict that information warfare would become a top national security issue after the US intelligence community released that report that identifies disinformation and fake news as a key part of Russia's strategy in meddling in the US presidential election. Uh, one of the most alarming things for me has been seeing firsthand how news and information can be manufactured I saw you know, when inside of a Russian-sponsored newsroom, um, but how that narrative has spread in, uh, to all corners of the internet, on social media outlets, conspiracy theory platforms, right-wing outlets, and most troubling, making its way to the mainstream conversation with pro-Russian talking points parroted on Fox News we see these days. Um, it's been damaging to the national discourse. It's further divided Americans and it has paralyzed people from being able to distinguish between fact and fiction. So in short, Russian information warfare has worked uh, probably even better than they thought it would. As a uh, former anchor and reporter for RT's American branch before I epically dropped the mic, um, I saw firsthand how the news is skewed and manufactured to broadcast a narrative that demonizes the US, uh, the EU, and NATO. In order to carry this out, Russian media doesn't play by the traditional rules of journa journalism. It creates a world in which facts can't be verified and where there's no such thing as an objective reality. As a result, reality can be molded into anything that the Kremlin wants it to be. Now, uh, we have a Russian-friendly president that seems to be unaware that Russia is an adversary to the US and our European allies. As a result, media outlets tasked with defending him uh, have also become more Russian friendly, prompting viewers to believe that something as serious as Russia meddling in our elections is just fake news. But the reality is, with tensions between Russia and the West at its highest since the end of the Cold War, Kremlin-sponsored disinformation in the digital age is operating with an unprecedented intensity uh, over the years, Russia has honed its weaponization of disinformation, and there's no doubt that they will continue to engage in information warfare in future elections, uh, propagate distrust against Western institutions and values, and shape the narrative in the Kremlin's favor. Uh, I saw firsthand that Ukraine was a, a, a tipping point. During the war in Ukraine, Russian media was mobilized as a propaganda tool. It was used to manipulate people into believing half-truths and lies about the conflict there. Um, I saw how that was orchestrated when the protests erupted in Maidan Square. It was made to look not like a popular uprising, but a coup compromised mostly of neo-Nazis and fascists. And through suggestive and misleading language, um, RT and similar outlets pinned the blame on the West for fomenting the unrest in Ukraine. And then when Russian troops invaded Crimea, Russian media looked the other way playing into the Kremlin's denials. And then these denials were given some credence not only in Russian-funded media, but in Western media organizations that indirectly gave strength to Russia's lies for the sake of balance. So the, uh, the themes and disinformation tactics uh, employed by RT during the war in, Ukra U war in Ukraine, they have been used before, uh, but not as vigor vigorously and, and not as strategically. Um, I saw how the most celebrated host at the station held very staunch anti-Western views, uh, and it wouldn't matter how credible those voices were as long as the underlying message was reinforced over and over again, that the US and the West is crumbling, corrupt, and hypocritical. 
Conspiracy theories were given a platform at the channel along with guests with viewpoints from the far right and the far left of the political spectrum uh, that, that range from, from unconventional to, to deranged. Um, but now, as I said, um, how pervasive disinformation and fake news and all of this, uh, we see characters like this now on, a, on our television screens on a daily basis. I don't know what that was. <laughs> um, <laughs> what is that? Um, so, um, so the thing is, uh, you know, disinformation, it doesn't work unless there's people that are swayed by it or people that believe in it. And as we see that there's a growing number of people that are um, swayed by it, um, that, are, that are prone to being manipulated by Russian propaganda because it plays in to this growing hatred toward the political establishment, which was kind of uh, the central message of our current president. <laughs> so now on both sides of the Atlant Atlantic, Russia is aware of the, this growing anti-establishment sentiment and, um, and knows how to manipulate them and, and, and radicalize this population. And those that challenge this narrative against Russia are branded as all kinds of things, CIA agents, uh, puppets for neoconservatives intent on reigniting a Cold War and uh, face the ire of, uh, as we saw with Jessica, of the seemingly countless online trolls that hijack online discussions. Uh, I was accused of being all these things and um, had to really use that block button for a while. Since my d departure, though, Russian disinformation has grown more extreme and more sinister. Russia has sent his milita its military into Syria to prop up Bashar al-Assad and continues to strategically target hospitals and civilians and Kremlin officials deny all of it and uses its media to echo these denials. It's used hacking, disinformation, fake news, legions of bots and trolls as part of its strategy to meddle in the US election. They tried to do it in France, weren't, weren't quite successful. Um, there's no doubt they'll try it in Germany and they'll try it in future elections. Now, the divisive political climate in the US and the EU um, has grown favorable to Russia and um, is easily exploited for its propaganda value. So um, I still maintain hope that the best weapon against this rapidly expanding yeah. propaganda campaign is the truth, but the challenge is to make the truth prevail in a sea of digital disinformation and propaganda and for the West to convince its own people to see through the messaging of a rogue government. And that concludes my opening. Thanks, Liz. So I, I think we're, we have enough time for how many? We have few about questions? 15 minutes. Great. So I'm going to use my privilege as the moderator to ask the first question. Um, so I think what we can take from this is that this disinformation is really aimed at undermining, I think, our democracy, our values, our confidence in our own system. In, in the Canadian case that I talked about in the intro introduction, I think that disinformation is intended to erode um, our perspectives on, on NATO and, and our confidence in that system. So how do we combat this? With the truth, of course. Um, that's, that's a good way to start. I think Jessica has really you know, created a model maybe for us to look at. Are there other ways? How do we combat this? Do we, do we um, try to increase media literacy amongst our populations? I, I mean, it just seems like such a vast and complex problem. So if you don't mind, Jessica? There are so many ways. And Finland has been really active in countering this. And um, first, I would like to say the journalistic methods. Obviously, journalists need to be more active in exposing uh, propaganda, in familiarizing themselves to this topic, because there are so many things, uh, so many uh, journalists who still do not see it happening, or they don't want to have anything to do with Russia issues. Really, honestly, uh, we have in Finland some journalists uh, who have told themselves that they don't want to touch this topic at all because they're afraid. Also, we have researchers, even civil servants, who say that they don't want to comment this uh, publicly because they become immediate targets of hate speech. So these people need uh, encouragement. 
and so it's good uh, uh, idea to support your local journalists to give them good feedback for good uh, articles um, and also um, other people who uh, might face some problems because of that. So, so there's journalism, investigations, support, preferably public support. It's really important that also our politicians uh, say out their knowledge and their views on this topic because we are seeing mm -hmm. also uh, silent or pro Kremlin politicians all around, so there should be uh, critical voices even more. And then, of course, in the most extreme cases, there should be uh, police investigations and prosecutions. And because this is actually international organized crime, there should also be good cooperation in between uh, police forces of different countries. That's, uh, that, that's where you can start battling this problem. Right. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, I th a big uh, the beginning, I think, is awareness, and um, it's been nice to see that there has been growing awareness about this issue, just in the in the past couple of years, um, and just understanding this phenomenon of disinformation and how it works. Um, Marcus had mentioned media literacy. I think that is a skill that there needs to be more focus on. So, um, every just the public can be more um, more. Act, more, the, the way that they consume the news, where they can kind of uh, be more critical, you know, think more critically and be able to differentiate between reliable and unreli unreliable sources. Um, and I, I think that it's actually going to take a lot of cooperation from all kinds of places. Um, I think the tech companies have a big part to play, and we're seeing uh, with Facebook getting some blame for uh, enabling the spread of fake news that they're now taking some steps to rid the, their platform of uh, fake news so it doesn't spread, um, so, m spread so much and kind of um, impact uh, and spread false stories. And that can even impact the way that people um, perceive po politics, and especially during an election. Um, and Twitter, as well, uh, taking action to um, get rid of some of the trolls and bots that are Russian sponsored, um, that come from places like the Troll Factory that Jessica played, paid a visit to in St. Petersburg. Um, and I personally think that there needs to be more accountability um, for those that spread, that spread disinformation or for news outlets that, um, that are not serving the goal of journalism, which is to inform people and to try to spread the truth. Um, in the UK, for example, they have something called Ofcom, where uh, if there is an, a news outlet that is, n is, not, is not displaying impartiality or is spreading false stories, um, that's not acceptable and they get sanctioned. We don't have anything like that in the US, but now with, this, uh, with the seriousness of this problem, um, I do believe that there, there does need to be some form of accountability. Um, I know there's some uh, measures taken in Congress to, to combat disinformation, but I think it's a, an effort uh, that it's you know that's going to involve government, it's going to involve tech companies, it's going to involve journalists, and it's going to involve uh, the public becoming more um, interested and, and aware, so they're not impacted by disinformation. Boris, um, I couldn't agree more with uh, everything which has been said, uh, but I would emphasize uh, the, role, uh, the role of uh, raising awareness. Uh, and I will give one example, a recent example from Lithuania. Uh, not, not long ago, a month or so ago, uh, it was the another attempt of Russia to uh, distribute almost the same story uh, which was distributed in, in Germany about raping underage girl in Lithuania by a German soldier. So um, it haven't worked, absolutely. And the reason of this is that our society is well aware about these kind of tricks. And the other reason is that our government was uh, very successful in uh, denying uh, the story in two hours or something like that. So they absolutely failed. 
And that is uh, the good example of how uh, it should be done. Well, certainly the Lithuanian government could come and educate the Canadian government <laughs> a little bit as well. Uh, they'll, they'll need some of that. Okay, so questions from the floor. So we'll start on the left and then maybe move to the right. Um, speaking, Ms. Ara, I was speaking as someone who has been a target of Russian attacks personally for many years, longer probably than you've been alive. Um, welcome to the club and full solidarity. As the Soviets used to say, it's not touch as well to be attacked. Mark of quality to be attacked by them. Well done. Um, <laughs> Um, you mentioned Mr. Bachman and his association with the Donet so called Donetsk People's Republic. Under American sanctions and under the EU sanctions both, he is vulnerable to sanctions potentially because of his support for the Donetsk People's Republic. In my experience, and I suspect in all of yours, the Russians use and the Kremlin uses the same kinds of people for different bad ends. So someone who is funding the militias in Syria or the night wolves is apt to be funding the Ukrainian um, separatists and the St. Petersburg uh, troll farm or the bot factories. This, in addition to all the good suggestions I heard up here, American action and Western action, don't forget the possibility of going on the offense, not just the defense, going after these people and their financial sources. This is, there is <clears throat> escalatory potential, and we have <coughs> used the sanctions tool to both to defend ourselves and go after those um, I'm encouraged to hear you say that the Finnish government is active. Um, my experience is that the Finnish government over many years is that the Finns are very good, especially in private, if you don't ask too much of them in public. Um, I'm speaking of the government, not of the private sector, but this is good. Finally, I'm now, with, after 40 years in the Foreign Service, I've now retired. I'm with the Atlantic Council, and I'm governments and uh, other NGOs with tech and social media companies. Because all of the, it will require an effort as sophisticated as the Russian effort. Um, the analogy I use is that Western democracies take time to form our antibody. I suppose I've just reduced this, the Russians to the status of germ or bacteria but they started it. Um, we need to take this seriously. The US government, um, I can tell you, has a lot of people in it who want to help. Whether or not the leadership agrees, I cannot say. But I'm now outside, and I will tell you, and I'll tell Jay Banks that I will do whatever I can uh, to mobilize the various forces uh, to beat back this and having been called the great cardinal of the color revolutions um, <laughs> uh, and attack on that ground, um, I couldn't help but say congratulations. It's nice to see young people getting slammed and slammed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> no, but it's a pattern. Uh, I'm now making my book and I'm looking into cases uh, in which person became slandered and uh, 
beaten up mentally uh, virtually uh, after they told their information publicly about Russia or Russian regime or Russian politics and you know it's immediate it's international uh, ongoing pattern and you know the good thing about these trolls and fake news uh, is actually that now we can backtrack them earlier when social media or internet or fake news platforms were not um, in uh, were not so present with Russian disinformation we could not backtrack where it's originating from uh, who is spreading it who is the uh, key central uh, place for it uh, who is it af affecting who is it influencing at the moment thanks to the trolls and thanks to the social media propagandists everything is public we can see it uh, very detailedly um, so not uh, um, so yeah I'm just trying to look at the positive sides of that uh, sliming and uh, slandering but yeah also it's a really uh, interesting idea to sanction also these activists for some reason we have a very a high amount of pro-Kremlin activists who are actually working for the Russian regime in Finland I don't know why I really don't know but there there is Janus Putkonen who works uh, as the head of public broadcasting company in Donetsk. Earlier he was just uh, the um, head of international programming disinformation operation Donny News. Uh, and before that uh, he was only operating as Finnish language conspiracy theory and propaganda site uh, uh, boss. So, but uh, they are always cooperating together and making these operations together. And there are many others more. I don't know if it's because we have so good freedom of speech or do we have even too free speech. But yeah, now, now I think the winds are changing for these people. The bad guys hate us. <laughs> Actually, there were hack hacked emails, which uh, you can see that Janus Putkonen was um, saying that he doesn't get enough money, can he please get more money from Russians? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually have on upnorth.eu, we have a wonderful profile of uh, Johan Bachmann that was uh, uh, written by a large group of, of Finnish journalists who are, are enraged by what's happening there. So I encourage you to go and and take a look. There's all sorts of information about him, about his background, and, and some of his work. Now, do we have time for one, one more question? Let's do one more question, and then it's time for lunch. Oh, how do I choose? Um, you know what? Y your hand was up first, so. And I'm sure everyone will, will be sticking around, and, and we'll be able to talk after the, the panel as well, a little bit. Marcus, I, I agree with uh, the panel head. Uh, Jessica's really a heroine. She has a compelling story to tell about trying to expose a troll army, false news, that has really ravaged her life over many years. And Liz, you're the expert, American media. I think her story, Jessica's story, should be told again and again and again. What advice would you have for, yes, uh, for her to have her story more widely publicized in the U.S. media. Was that a question for me? Yes. Well, she's here. Uh, I wish you had more time here. We got to get you on um, <laughs> on more uh, media here. Um, I know that the New York Times wrote wrote about it. Um, I think now I've got a Pulitzer. I, oh yeah, really? Oh, that's nice. Serious. Yeah, um, but now I think there is so much more uh, interest among the public. Um, for it's kind of like, you know, this niche Russia watching community that really understands what's going on. Um, I think the challenge, uh, as we see, is to um, make um, the American people, the public, uh, understand this threat. And um, because I think that um, without widespread understanding, we're going to people are gonna to continue to be manipulated by disinformation. Um, I'm actually working on a story with Jessica where I profile her story and um, this phenomenon of trolls. And um, 
I don't know, just keep, keep speaking out, keep talking. Um, she's doing a good job though. She's, she, speaks about, she speaks about it all over, all over Europe and here and um, definitely we'll, we should continue to get your story out. All right, well, I think that wraps up the panel. Now, for all the sort of the uh, unpleasant uh, discussion that we've had about these unpleasant issues, if you want to feel good about something, I would encourage going to YouTube and actually looking at Liz's video where she gets up from the, the anchor desk on RT. It's great. Um, take a look at that, it'll make you feel better. Uh, thanks again to all of our panelists, and uh, we'll see you at lunch. Uh, lunch is being served immediately upstairs in the atrium ballroom. So I ask you to go upstairs. We're going to continue the program right away. So it's upstairs um, on, the, on the second level at the atrium ballroom. Set up there. So do you need a hand lugging this stuff? Uh, I'll get one of my guys. Yeah, hold on.